Hello everyone and welcome to A Talk With. I've got a new setup and I'm here today talking to the one and only John Dorney. Introduce yourself. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm John Dorney, pretty much as, as as you've mentioned. It would be weird if I said I was anyone else at this point. <laughs> mm, unless you've got like so many different personalities in your head. Like the, uh... Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, that could happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I got very bored like 20 years ago. I worked front of house at the Palace Theatre. Uh, mm. in the west end of London and uh, I was working in front of house and I would pretend to be from Bratislava because <laughs> I could record them anyway. and I, I went for Bratislava on the basis that I'm pretty sure no one really actually knows where it is um, yeah, I can't say I do either yeah it's like what, what's a Bratislavan accent I did a generic um, Eastern European kind of accent to try and um, would just yeah en enjoy myself by being yeah ridiculously <laughs> my job that, that is brilliant. Well, what was it like working front of house? Like, um, where, uh, where you like, um, uh, how, like, where were you kind of in your journey as a creative journey? Oh, it was, it was sort of like you know, jobbing actor. I think it was around about the year two thousand, and uh, yeah, I'd been doing lots of writing, but also at the same time, it was, it was, if anything, it was kind of the beginning of writing. At least part of the reason I ended up leaving that job. Uh, this is a, an accidentally natural segue. It's amazing. Um, at least part of the reason I ended up leaving the job was I had written a play mm. uh, called Cowboys that I submitted to sort of the Young Writers Festival at the Royal Court, and they asked me to. They, they put it on uh, in the Young Writers Festival and asked me to attend. So I kind of wanted wanted to not just see mine. I wanted to see everybody's plays because there were about eight on, yeah. and so I kind of pretty much quit the job in order to do that. So it's, that's effectively like very early doors of it yeah and and part of the thing that really encouraged me to keep going with writing really it was it was a, the, the probably the earliest actual proper success yeah so that was kind of like the was that would you say that was like a direct point or was it like a gradual kind of evolution from kind of like primarily actor to more writing i mean uh, i i mean look, look right acting is um is a lot harder to kind of get any sort of traction with because mm -hmm. writing particularly like writing plays as I was doing then it's you can all you need is a pad of paper yeah. uh, you don't even necessarily I mean you know you probably could do with a computer or an iPad or something like that to send it out to people but by and large you can get a lot of it done on a pad of paper and you can write and redraft and uh it it's the most accessible thing to do creatively you know I would say like painting or something like that um no one can stop you doing it in a way that acting kind of needs someone to say yeah you can come and do this uh so it it, it was uh something I was always doing so the play itself I think I'd written maybe about I think it was about 97 98 um and uh, yeah just took me two years or so to kind of do anything with it and polish it up and develop it a little bit yeah. um and it was, but it was, if anything, I've always kind of think of them both as being kind of a bit parallel. So even when I'm, I've been doing like a, a good chunk of like theatre tours over the years. And uh, pretty much the only thing I do all, all day is write, is, 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 is write, is write. I go to a coffee shop, like buy yeah. a coffee and some form of cake, usually a blondie, uh, if it's at all possible. And then just, um, you know, type in the afternoon. And it, it, it kind of weirdly feels like, doing them both particularly simultaneously means that each one feel, makes the other one feel like the job whichever one you're doing at any given point so if I'm writing I'm largely thinking oh my great I just have to I don't have to be remembering anything and yeah. shout I can just make stuff up um and if you're acting at the same time you kind of go oh this is fantastic I just have to do something I already know I don't have to be coming up with ideas and developing things this is just stuff I've learned that somebody else has come up with it's fantastic. So yeah, they both yeah. kind of work terribly well together. Yeah, I mean, it's it's brilliant that you've kind of had uh, fields in front of like, in front of an audience and kind of from an uh, sort of like in front of the camera, behind the camera in a way. Does yes. that kind of help you talk more about it? Because I know you're a co-host on the Big Pick Movie oh, yeah, uh, yeah. podcast, which I'll link in the description, by the way. Uh, how did that podcast begin, by the way? And um, what's it like hosting a podcast? Kind of oh well, I mean, you, you, you know, to a degree. It, I mean, it, it's a lot of fun actually. That the uh, the best pit podcast kind of happened through like a combination of circumstances. So my friend uh, Tom Solinsky, who has written a few big finishes as well, um, he uh, did a play that I turned up in called Coalition years ago, which also featured this um, other actor called Jessica Regan, uh, who's uh, terribly smart and cine literate and all of that. 
uh, but we all kind of loved films and Tom was a bit Oscar obsessed and would sit up quite late at night um, and have an Oscar party that he would invite anyone to. And the absolute mainstays of that were me, him and Jess, where we would turn up and we would do the entire night. Everybody else would like peel off or come every other year or whatever. They'd have other commitments. But but the moment the, 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 the Oscars, the date of the Oscars is announced, it would go straight in my, my calendar. And I know, right. I make that evening, I've got nothing else happening because I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, and then sort of related to that, um, Jess did uh, a couple of years as uh, as a regular in Doctors. Mm. And uh, when she, she got asked to do Celebrity Mastermind, and she decided to do it about the films of Quentin Tarantino, which given her character uh, mm. in Doctors would have been quite a surprise to me, but this kind of weird gulf between the character she played and the, the, the person she actually is. Uh, it's almost as if she, she's an actor, mm. um, but yeah, she she we kind of all like started like testing her on questions, and like so I would rewatch a lot of them, and we'd kind of like meet up occasionally and, and, and prep her. And there was just I think there was at least like one day when we all sat down and watched a slightly obscure Billy Wilder film called One Two Three, which is yeah. which is worth a look. It's it's not one of his absolute belters, but it's not one of his weaker efforts. It's um it feels like it's based on a play, and it's got a really good sort of setup where where James Cagney is um, this guy who kind of solves all his problems by the halfway point and then and then you kind of go oh where's it going now and then just one tiny thing happens and you go oh that's where it goes and it's really kind of a wild well thing and I think um, it kind of led away from that just this vague idea of doing something because Tom uh, produces the Guilty Feminist podcast which is hugely successful so I think he's always quite podcasty anyway and yeah hosting it is, is just was great fun really um, it was just I do a lot of research which took a lot of time and a lot of effort and energy uh, but then I'll just get to watch a film with my mates and and then talk about the film, which was exciting. And, you know, some of them were terrible and some of them were amazing. So and uh, and there were a lot of films that I probably otherwise would never have got to see. And yeah, just the, the ability to say that I have watched every film that won Best Picture of the Oscars, which is a really tricky thing to do, I think, unless you actually set out to do it. I think that is a bit rather tricky. I think um, and I think it's great that uh, you kind of have friends with shared interests in that, uh, mm. that kind of field and. You know, like, uh, I think that's what uh, makes podcasting such a viable and great kind of path to go down, even if it's yeah. like, uh, uh, you have your main thing and then you have, like, you just meet up with your friends and watch a movie and get to talk about it. I think that's great. And it's part of the reason I love doing this is I just get to yeah. bring people on and talk about things that we have. It's, it's, if anything, it's an excuse to have a conversation in a weird sort of way because because you know you actually go well we we'll be meeting up with them like every couple of weeks and discussing something, um, and then if other people kind of listen to it and enjoy what enjoy listening to it, that's fine. But ultimately, the, these things kind of are really uh, a, a, about um, yeah a, a kind of excuse to meet people and see people again, which I, I really rather love. Weirdly, I've just literally just messaged just to say oh we should do a should do a pint sometime soon because we haven't in a while. She's been in a, a play in central London and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, she's a good egg. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're completely right. I think, um, because, of course, we met at the BFI bar. Of course. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, that was an absolutely fantastic night. Uh, Penny nights and people piggybacking around the bar. Was that you, by the way, who was piggybacking around the bar? or like? Oh, no, I think, it, I, I, think uh, I, I think Alfie Shaw picked me up or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. I can't entirely remember. It, yeah. it, was, it was, yeah, it's not something I wouldn't voluntarily do. So, weirdly, um, I did... Like last year, at some point, I piggybacked Joe Castleton, who like was in lots of sort of early uh, BBB spin-offs and some of the big finishes. Who I've been a tour of a play with, I piggybacked her up a hill in Malvern, uh, which um, was phenomenally stupid because that's quite a hill. And um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that was that was one hell of a night. I, I have a lot of fun memories from that, and I think the great thing about that was just meeting up with a lot. It's sort of the same thing. Podcasts meet up with a lot of people with similar interests, and then inviting them to come on because mm. it's nice talking to them. It's nice talking to you, for example. It's brilliant. I mean, uh... yeah, it's delightful to speak to you. Yes, it's always fun. I, I, I find it kind of entertaining. I'd quite like to make an effort to get to the BFI screenings, even though I tend not to actually see the shows mm. uh, to go along afterwards because it's kind of like oh, it's just it, it's effectively like the bar in at any convention hall. Yeah, really. I, but I don't particularly feel the urge to watch the because I've seen them and I've been getting them on DVD. And um, yeah, I'm a bit too attention deficit to even do like more than one in a row. That's uh, more than fair. I mean, I've been to I've been to a fair few. Uh, my first was Evil of the Daleks. Um, oh yes, 
that was amazing but uh very um i was very awkward on my uh, first time going to be a fire meeting mm-hmm. because i've gone to pretty much everyone since and uh i funny enough for the sea devils i didn't actually see the sea devils uh oh, yeah. comic con that day um which was a great kind of mix of kind of meeting people and socializing and networking and all that and it was great. It was great meeting people at both. I think you mentioned Comic Cons, <laughs> kind of like going onto that kind of circuit and um, yeah. and being recognised in general. Actually, well, the thing I the thing I kind of like about a lot of these is that um, Doctor Who fans are, are the kind of the easiest people to talk to. Oh, you yeah. know, um, well, if you're another Doctor Who fan, maybe not if you're not a Doctor Who fan, but but kind of going along, there's a kind of an immediate warmth. Of, we're all here for the same thing. We all kind of have an obvious shared interest in the shared. Yeah. love of, 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 of the same sort of thing i particularly kind of find it quite fun uh things like big finish day because i, I i'm always very much of the opinion uh that that we're all kind of on the same sort of level we're all basically the same thing i'm a professional fan fiction writer i'm not really kind of like you know i, I i'm i'm aware that uh there isn't really i don't like there to be the things that like a table between you as such even though occasionally you have to because you're signing things or whatever that was one of the questions i have to ask you is about you yeah. saying that on twitter because of course i brought that up with the bfi and the yes. way I've it here is one moment on twitter that i absolutely loved was when you compared Fan work and big finish work, noting that big finish yeah. writers are fan writers, as you said. I absolutely yes. love that sentiment. Really, it is completely accurate and very much agree. Uh, but how would you kind of expand upon that? How would you kind of compare fan work and big finish work in terms of restrictions and freedoms and stuff like? Oh that? yeah, I mean yes, I think uh, I mean on a fairly obvious level, yeah, we are, we have to have the stuff uh, licensed and approved by the BBC. Um, weirdly, I, th- I think there's kind of all manner of tears to it. Somebody was talking about. Uh, like the TV series as well. Now, the, it's, yeah. it's, somebody I'm, I'm chatting with, weirdly, a guy I'd worked at the Palace Theatre with, uh, who's, a, who's a big Doctor Who fan, and he was saying, you know, he, he does, he's saying, well, I think sometimes the big finish might cater a bit more for the fans, and you kind of go, well, of course it does, because the TV series is a mass market international program, uh, and so they have restrictions as well, mm-hmm. uh, in that you've got to kind of do things that are kind of populist and you kind of and 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 broad. Uh, and the big finish kind of has to work on a slightly different level where you can be a little bit more specific and a little bit more um, yeah. uh, niche. Uh, but even then, I think then you've got the levels be below that again, where the not below that, but you know, the, the, of the of, of like unlicensed stuff, where yeah. where you can kind of do whatever you like and you can do mashups and things like that. So yeah, I I, I it is a that, that I suppose is the difference basically fan fiction but licensed fan fiction and and so where it has to go through an approval and has to kind of meet and, and with what the bbc are wanting to do and what the license allows us to do um um and that can be quite specific and you know it can be things in terms of like uh how you use violence for example um how you use recurring characters how you know sort of bad language all of that sort of things mm. um yeah, yeah. That, I, I would say that's kind of the only appreciable difference, really. Yeah. Um, uh, that that uh, there are certain things about style and um, and generally the way you approach these things, that I think would be would be different. But ultimately, um, it's got it, it's it's heart and soul is the same thing. It, it's it's uh, stories written by the fans for the fans, and it's all Doctor Who at the end of the day. Of course, there's yes, oh, absolutely. Label, there's labels. I think. Um, you know, what I love about fan work in particular and mm-hmm. also is when they do what only they could do. I, I love yes. um, uh, fan, uh, like there's fan audios that are five minutes to ten minutes telling like a really in-depth story. Mm. Of course, Big Finish couldn't release something that was five minutes or like the TV show couldn't release. Uh, well, they could release a Minnesota, but it wouldn't be. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting when they, I mean, uh, I know, uh, uh, a fan film producer that's doing a film that's quite violent that is quite you know yeah a bit more violent and um you know I, I've, I i love it when fan films and audios do stuff like that that kind of uh but i also love it when they're just i, I love all sort of all, all content all around really and like mm. a big finish like when they're just doing stories that could only be told in audio but i love yeah I love it when they're just telling doctor who it's all doctor who and i love it all but well it, yeah I, that they all use their kind of you know they they all they all use their levels to the best of their what they can do i think it's one of the 
the things I kind of particularly love at the moment is, um, and in particular, I, I, I adore sort of the creativity that it inspires in the fan base. I don't kind of, I don't read too much or listen to too much of the actual like Doctor Who fan fiction audios or whatever, yeah. mainly because I don't want to subconsciously steal ideas. And also when you've spent your entire day working on these things, it's the last thing you want to do is kind of go, I'm going to relax by reading some fan fiction. Um, but yeah. I'm always keen to encourage people to do any of that sort of stuff because it's you know it's where we all kind of started to yeah. varying degrees um and also at the same time i just love you know people doing art people doing uh you know youtube videos about things and indeed podcasts it's just i, I think the with a lot of these things creativity is 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 the end in itself it's i mean i feel obviously i'm in a sort of um a very privileged position in being able to kind of effectively make a living from it. Um, but I, I, I kind of think that it'd probably still be kind of tootling away, writing some things and ideas. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't because it, it's still writing itself is the thing I kind of find I enjoy. And, and if people find joy in it, then it is sort of an end to itself. Um, and, and of course, you've got the, the great advantage of, of just being so many places to share your work. I've just started trying to get better about, um, I've, I've always been like retweeting art, if people said it, but I think I'm kind of starting to put them up on my Instagram more and hopefully I'll get into doing that a bit more over the next couple of days. Uh, because the amount of times people send me some like amazing art that they've done inspired yeah. by something. And it, it's just all kind of like, pro probably like, oh, well, this is, you know, the, the, that some sort of random thing I came up with um, has inspired them to actually spend actual time of out of their life creating some images is 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 a huge honor. It's Absolutely, insanely in ta uh, talented community and yeah, I absolutely love seeing all the art and working with artists as well. Um, mm -hmm. I love that Shuti Gatwa uh, reposts and comments. Oh yeah, he's cool that. for that, isn't he? Yeah. He oh, look, I mean commented on the Dominic G. Martin's recent yeah, exactly. post, which, you know, that, that makes well, people say that's... Well, you know. I was going to say that's, Dom is a, kind of an amazing example where obviously it's someone who started off doing the fan stuff, has kind of got onto doing some big finished stuff because I've worked with him at, at least twice. Um, only one of those is public knowledge, but there's twice. Um, but then still kind of does his sort of the, the fan stuff and still keeps his foot in both. And then and then that connection to his social to get where it's just that bit of going, wow, this just feels it's all connected and all sort of yeah. such an exciting world to be part of. And, you know, and I, I, I said, somebody I asked on Twitter ages ago, something about who kind of inspired you. And I, I feel Dom is the future in a way. I'm oh, kind yeah. of, I, I'm on, I'm on the sort of the downward uh, path at the moment, whereas Dom is on the, on, on the up and will sort of uh, rule Doctor Who at some point in the future. I, I, I sincerely hope because I, 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 he would be a delightful person to be, you know, doing that stuff. Cause yeah, he's, um, yeah, thoroughly delightful, positive egg, and really sort of, oh, uh, I, yeah. I completely agree. I mean, I, I have uh, talked to him for a while now, going to conventions with him and so forth, and he couldn't be lovelier. Genuinely, just, I was I was on a panel with him, actually, at one of the Comic-Cons. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a MCM Comic-Con, some of the uh, uh, some, uh, community show thing, uh, where, I mean, that's where I kind of met Dom, and he's absolutely lovely, really talented, creative, and... Yeah, before I get sidetracked, there is one thing I know I have to bring up that I must. I've got to. Yeah, good. It is, it, it's insanely positive, and I absolutely love that you guys are doing this. But uh, uh, it's the run that you're doing with uh, collecting oh, yes. English writers around your namesake, Dorney Lake. Yes. Uh, if you could just tell me a bit more about that and tell people at home about that. Yes. That at the um, description. Well, there's a bunch of, um, I, I slightly lose count whether it's six or seven of us. Um, doing a 10k run around Dorney Lake at the, at the time of recording. I think it's almost exactly a month away. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it, it was kind of largely initiated by uh, Lisa McMullen, who was thinking of doing a run and a charity run and like sent a message to one of our WhatsApp groups saying, does anyone want to join me? And she said, um, I was thinking of doing this 10k around Dorney Lake. And it was just this bit of a go, oh, you, you, you absolute bastard. You, <laughs> you, you, you picked Dorney Lake. Everyone else, everyone else can say no. I'm morally, I, I, I can't say no, because it would be, if it, but Dorney's not doing it, yeah, that's ridiculous. So, so um, I um, I absolutely went for that. I've, I've done like Couch to 5K a couple of times. Mm. Um, the, um, yeah, so I was kind of on the way, but I've literally just finished doing 
like an actual again a run at catch the 5k and then trying to work up the 5k to 10k plan which i'm not entirely sure i've got enough time for but i think that I, th I think the actual plan i'm following is like assuming you're actually going to like try and properly race it and go no 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 i i want to go around 10k at a pace slightly faster than dead that's that's i'd be happy with that um uh, yeah we're doing it to uh raise uh money for cancer research um there's there's Lisa McMullen's doing it, Rob Valentine's doing it, Alfie Shaw's doing it, Andrew Smith is doing it, Lizzie Hopley's doing it, I'm doing it. I feel I might have missed one. Um uh, interesting. possibly I'll it'll be in the description anyways, but yeah. Yeah, there'll be in the description. But if, but yeah, if you kind of want to find the link, it's sort of I think written as uh for the for, for the love of running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but uh yeah that we're we're tweeting um and facebooking and instagramming on occasion uh the link um yeah because we wanted to sort of raise money for cancer research i lost both my parents to cancer in varying forms uh so it's a it's it's, it's a thing i'm particularly not a fan of um and uh at the moment i think we're in the region of three to four thousand pounds of money raised and yeah we, we're, we're not really you know well, some of us are runners more than others i think i think like you know matt and andy and uh alfie are probably sort of way more acceptable than say me where i'm just like kind of going oh yeah i, I went out for like a 20 minute tempo run i think it was called yesterday or something like, or was it a speed yeah. run i'll come there was something but it was like 20 minutes of solid like a pacey run i go oh oh this is pain this is i'm not used to this and just yeah. like I think with about two minutes, I was going. This is not going to be fun. But I, I, I genuinely like listen to the big finish stuff whilst I'm doing it because it forces me to do like thirty minutes. I can't give up because I've got to get to the end of an episode. But yesterday I was finishing off. I think it's conspiracy in space. I think I'm doing the return of Joe Jones uh, next tomorrow. With, uh, oh God, it's more of the damn running. But yes, anyway. <laughs> so do you do you think you're dreading the final one? Do you think you'll be prepared enough to do the ten k? Yeah, like I know. Oh, you're I mean. Way. I'm definitely yeah. dreading it. I think I'll probably yeah. I, I will manage. I feel that because I say I think the five k to ten k program is saying like about nine, you know, six day sessions, and you go well. I can't manage that, but I think the last one I'll be able to manage it is approximately saying like do a fifty minutes fifty minute speed run. And you go, you know what? If I can manage that on the, I say that would be close enough to doing like a ten k, even if I like get through a lot of it. And go and uh, now I'm going to just relax down a bit and and try and I I I am dreading it. But mm. I will. I'll probably be fine. I think so. Hopefully. Yeah. If, if even if it's just even if it's just that whole sort of you know walking across hot coal thing of going. Once I've finished this, I can stop running mm. for at least a bit. Or you know, I'll probably try and keep it up to a degree to keep relatively healthy, like keep doing the thirty k or something like. That. Not the thirty k. That would be insane. The five k. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck, and I'll put the link to that on the top of the description. That um, is very kind. Of yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's a, obviously a great course and one that's very personal to you. I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your parents. That's horrible. I, I can't imagine what it's like uh, to lose your parents to that, but they'd be very proud of you. I... Yeah, they, they, yeah they, they always were blessed. And they, they, they were incredibly supportive of me and it meant that, you know, when I won my uh, BBC award for Absent Friends, I, I sort of paid tribute to them both at the time, even though I didn't have my dad at the time, but still have my mum. But just the opportunity to kind of say thank because I think anyone in the creative industry does need that kind of support. Uh, yeah. you know, to be, you know, to not have parents who kind of constantly saying, "Why didn't you get a real job? When are you going to be on TV?" or those sort of things. It's just they they um, could not have been more enthusiastic about what I wanted to do and what I ended up doing. Yeah, yeah, and I couldn't agree more on that sentiment about uh, parental support and everything. I know I'm, I was very well when I when I started writing and doing like. Uh, 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 I went into like college and did uh, filmmaking and uh, my yeah. parents were very supportive of that but I didn't tell them that I was doing anything on YouTube that I didn't tell them that I was uh, writing any Doctor Who or anything like that in a fan capacity I was it wasn't shame as per se or, or, or even embarrassment I just didn't want to it, it was like keeping something to myself and mm -hmm. that, I, I, looking back in retrospect that was very unhealthy that, that I should have shared that with them properly and when I did, because I was on that panel that I was invited to, they just kept saying how proud they were. That they, they, the one thing they oh. mentioned most of the time was, "We thought you were in your room just doing nothing, but you were writing oh. all this." And then, um, 
one of uh something that I wrote that I released a while back uh on Christmas on 2021 was one of the last things that my dad listened to and I remember oh, wow. I remember how proud he was and I think his support has helped me develop more as a creative beyond yeah. that and uh when I probably would have crumbled without that support you know without that uh because after he sadly passed away it would have just yeah I, I I was severely burnt out which in itself is a segue to one of my other questions that I ask everyone on this okay. show is how do you cope slash deal with burnout uh what's your process when it comes to burnout because it's something that everyone oh seems through. well to be honest it's one of, I mean the <sighs> It's it's a tricky thing. It's it, 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 I I don't have a specific process really. I mean, I think the thing with me that always helps is I mean deadlines are, are incredibly useful because you know I I think if I didn't have deadlines I probably might not ever get anything finished. Um, so even if you don't have a deadline, maybe set yourself a deadline. Um, it can it can be useful with the big finished stuff that is quite sort of flexible. But then occasionally there's times when you're going, okay, if, if you're going to give me like two months freedom to kind of to deliver a script again i'll probably spend two of those months going i oh, can't quite get anything i you know if you kind of force yourself into a position of going i must come up with an idea then you will so um so maybe yeah kind of lock into that to, to be honest for me it's almost always like going out for long walks to try and trigger things into it and, and like often listening to music or swimming um anything where i'm kind of because i'm quite attention deficit disorder it's it, it um it, it, it's all useful stuff to kind of have something else that distracts me yeah. a little just a little bit so swimming requires a tiny bit of focus but that means that the brain can kind of take over the background some music i listen to because um again it's my brain is ever so slightly yeah listening to it, but, it's, but it means it yeah it tends to be something that it tends to be music have to be music that i know a, a bit but not you know so so it's just to keep so I can hear it. It's distracting brain enough, but I'm not like listening to the lyrics, particularly yeah. going or hearing it, you know, because I, because I've heard the song several times before. So I'm kind of just like going along with it. Uh, and then, you know, it's just like having conversations with friends and discussing things and all that stuff. It, it kind of really adds up, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people on, uh, that I've invited on have mentioned walks in particular as uh, their means of kind of combating it in a way. Uh, I've been going on more walks recently and I found it's helped me actually I didn't really because uh, of course while I ask people that question on the show I don't really uh, I probably should take their advice more but because you know uh, a lot of people come on I don't really take all the advice so but recently going on more walks has really helped kind of I mean I, uh, I found some of the time in, in lockdown it found it sort of weirdly useful because mm. I was stuck in sort of Waterloo I ended up walking around the Imperial War Museum gardens for quite a bit yeah. And and that's that barely counts as a walk. There's a degree to which, if you can kind of like go out into the countryside and just keep walking for miles, if anything, that was perhaps sli- would be slightly less useful because I'm like checking out the gun. But yeah, I was just doing loops around this like sort of area that wasn't terribly well used, just kind of just letting the brain tick over because I wasn't going terribly far. I was it, yeah, it, it, I wasn't actually going anywhere, or achieving anything. I was just going in circles. Uh, because again, it was that bit of going. Yeah, this is just something to keep me going, and and I've got no no distractions. I can't have the internet on. I can't play a game or anything like. That. All I've got is just a bit of thinking about the same plot and just doing loops of the same area mm-hmm. um, until I would vaguely come up with something. Yeah, I mean, um, oh, also about the uh, meeting time. By the way, I'll I'll uh, I'll stop the call at around one minute and then start up a new one. Each Grand. Time. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I'll ask her one more question because before this call ends and start a new one, send you a new link, etc. Sure, 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 yeah. So uh, one question I kind of got from Jack Alexander, that's a friend of the podcast who also runs a podcast, that um, I also wanted to ask as well, actually, was, um, uh, so it was about like the social media reaction to some of your stories, because like, yes. especially buying time, because yes. buying time and the cliffhanger to that, and uh, before, you know, I'll, I'll I'll say that to everyone watching now that there will be spoilers to that yep. that we'll discuss now. But the cliffhanger to buying time is probably one of the maddest days to be on Twitter I've had on that platform. Yeah. Um, what was it like from your perspective seeing those reactions? And did did you kind of let out a little giggle before like the episode released, knowing that oh. so mad? Yes. Well, I kind of, if I remember rightly, I kind of, I think I tweeted. 
um, something along the lines, like when it was released, I thought, by time, wrong woman is out, Dark Universe One is out, huzzah, I expect, I expect tweets in about an hour, because mm-hmm. I, that, I, I thought, yeah, people will kind of like go demented on it, because I, I knew it was a good cliffhanger, and um, yeah, and yeah, so there was a tiny bit of that. But at the same time, what you've always got to bear in mind is, I, I was slightly distracted because I hadn't heard it. So I was listening to it um, and so I didn't think I started right at the same time. So I wasn't quite seeing it 100% live, but I was kind of keeping a degree of, but I was having the joy of kind of listening to it for the first time myself because I'd not heard masses of the original recording either. Sometimes you kind of listen in a bit. I don't think we got to listen into much of that one. I don't recall listening into much. Um, but yeah, that was a, uh, yeah, there, there was definitely, a, so every now and then you'll come up with a cliffhanger and go, Oh yeah, I'm quite excited for this one. Weirdly, it's not like it's something. Um, the, the cliffhanger kind of comes naturally with the story a lot of the time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there just are times when you kind of go, "Oh no, that's a good one." Like so, Day of the Master episode one, a game of and go, "That's pretty good," and then the 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 realization about how I was going to do buying time, uh, weirdly, was one of these things I just mentioned about walking around the Imperial War Museum. Yeah. Um, because I, I developed the entire sort of outline of Dalek, Dalek Universe and what the story were going to be, but I rather belatedly realised what everybody else has like written their storylines is working out what they're doing. I, that I had my my outline was like it's a two part where the Doctor arrives. I thought, ah, I don't have a plot. I don't know what the story is, and I was vaguely feeling around all manner of different. I knew it had to be a bit time travelly. I was vaguely thinking I might use the Visions mainly because I. I had this idea I really liked about like the fact that they were invisible meant they were blind and that gave me a good like dramatic moment of and switch out all the lights and that's going to help us go no 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 that's taken away of that I liked that that detail yeah I think I'd even got as far as writing up to that point but I didn't quite know where it was going beyond then yeah. um and yeah I, I I went through so many different variations of what it was going to be I think for a while it was going to be something called time pirates exclamation mark and having people chasing the monk I think I could work with the monk quite early. Yeah. Um, because I mean, the quite, monk, quite, sorry, that was quite a shock while listening to it that they were bad. Yeah, well, it would. There were a few things about that I found quite fun. One was the fact that the monk feels like it's part of that universe because it's um, because there's a character, they're part of Dalek Master Plan, and so they that feels yeah. like they're, they're not too. So I think that's why I veered to the monk. But I I was coming up with ideas about them being on the run from someone who they'd stolen from. And I think that version of the storyline was where I came up with the idea of having their TARDIS be a Bible, mm. uh, which I thought, or a holy book, which I thought was a cool idea. And that's why I transposed that. But none of it was quite coming together. And and then I'd, I had an idea years ago, like when I was a kid, where mm. I thought that you should end a series of Doctor Who with the Doctor regenerating into... You would, you have the idea of a fake regeneration. The end of the series of Doctor with the Doctor regenerating, and the next story uh, is like a four-part story with the Doctor being the Doctor, and then at the end of it, they, it's revealed to be the Master or something like that. And um, weirdly, um, sort of things that kind of were almost that turned up over the years. So, like, I, I think it was before there was a comic strip in Incredible Hulk Presents called "Who's That Girl." which mm. I think it dates the idea of like as a kid, but kind of, which was a similar kind of thing. Pe- people think that, I think people have think it's a rip off of who's that guy. We go, no, it was, I'd, I'd had the idea differently and the bit with the key aspects of it, I th- the things I liked about the idea are, are different to the things that who's that guy. And it was weird because a lot of the changes I made in the interim veered it towards that. Cause there's the thing originally when I was a kid, it was going to be into a man mm. and it was going to be the master rather yeah. than the monk. Um, and then when it came on to now, um, uh there were i i vaguely been thinking about a, a female version of the monk for a while anyway yeah. uh mainly at least because there was a there was a possibility of us getting Whoopi goldberg in for an audio at some point oh, uh wow. genuine wow. yeah because she was doing sister act in london and we thought about it, i thought oh she that you, you, who would you cast her as maybe like a, a female monk That's and that made me think of a nun and it's kind of would feel kind of apt and that meant that that was in my brain and so when it was all beginning to come together into those sort of pieces where it just kind of happened. Also as well, the other thing about, if you realise that, I know pe- people are going to go to be, oh, they're being terribly woke by changing the sex of some of the characters. One of the things that's really good with that is it really does screw with your idea of guessing who this is going to be. Yeah. 
yeah. So if if, if if Tenet regenerated into like borderline, like you know, I don't know, someone who's a bit more obviously monk casting, you yeah, know, not Rufus Hound or Graham Hunt, but something along those lines, people might have gone, oh, might this be the monk? But because it's a woman, it immediately throws people off that trick. Yeah. Um, and, and, as well, as the monk is inspired casting. And yes. As the doctor for a time as well, they do a fantastic job, like the yeah. doctor. But that is, it, it, I think the the best like the best thing about that kind of cliffhanger and what it leads into is that you do get that time believing that the book that that you know they can't be, but you get that time with their fake yeah. doctor. So you can kind of imagine that kind of portrayal from them, and I loved how they played it. They just did a fantastic job. Fantastic. Yeah, job. it's great. I mean, I. I really had a fun time doing that one. But as I say, it was like literally after like having tried to break the story for weeks, mm. the moment I thought of, oh, what happens if it happened if that's the cliffhanger? Because then you've got the entire structure of it. You kind of know that you've got to then like build about another half hour of, of the fake before you can then go, here's what's really happened. And then that immediately gives you the final quarter of it and just and it, and figuring out the way it all hung together. So it went from like th- this occasion happens. I found I was working on a storyline again at the moment the one I'm just starting work on I finished the storyline and again it was about two months of going around going oh, I've got the premise but for some reason I can't like trigger it into an actual plot and then literally a conversation with my ex-girlfriend of all people uh there was like one thing she mentioned that ends up not even being in the plot but was enough to kind of nudge me over the line to go I missed this and then I think I wrote it like within a day or two and go oh I think this is quite fun um and it just sort of structured itself all about it. and yeah with um with, with that one, the moment I, I thought, why don't we use this idea um, that I did before, that I came up with when I was a kid? It's quite fun. Will I be allowed to? Will I be able to get away with it? Let's try. Uh, the story borderline wrote itself because all of the details it needed to fall into place you know, to go, well, this has to happen here, this has to happen here, this has to happen here. And and why, why does the monk need to impersonate the doctor? Well, because of this, this, and this. Um, and yeah, it all fell together quite naturally at that point. I, for one, I'm glad you got away with it. And we're back. Although for people watching, it would have been what two seconds for us. It was nine minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, Zoom being Zoom. Um. So, I I wanted to bring this up. Uh, last time during the last call. Uh, because we we've talked about like fans like um uh, being brought together by your work. Now, uh, this was actually by the trailer, but this is kind of a fun act though of like how I met one of my best friends in the fandom through Dalek Universe. Actually. Oh, exciting! Yes. For buying time, I actually met Jack Alexander, who uh, asked a similar question to what uh, I've written down, and it was about uh, you know the cliffhanger, and we uh, I tweeted about it like oh my god, what the hell just happened, and it was in the trailer, it was in the trailer for Dalek Universe. Oh yes, yes. As was Jack Alexander's, and that's how we met, and now he's one of my best. Oh mates lovely, in and that's uh, it was really lovely. Um, yeah, it's fair to say we both loved that cliffhanger. It it was a great, it it was a great way of uh yeah, it was a great way of meeting people because a lot of people yeah probably met each other. I'm close. Well, to, to be honest, I mean, again, this is the other reason I kind of like Doctor Vanner with so many of my sort of good friends are uh, via Doctor Who. So you know, we've got a little sort of writers WhatsApp group where it's just a sort of a delightfully supportive gang of people. Um, where you know you you kind of. You know, message people and you know you kind of go oh here's some of the things i'm frustrated by or here's some things i love or whatever and it's such a i mean we've literally um just been sort of messaging where uh one of them was wanting advice on a shirt for for, for their for their brother uh that was being bought by the mother and, and some of it like it was about a 50 50 sort of thing but some people liked it some people didn't it was really quite sort of but yeah yeah just kind of the positive energy yeah i mean i'm delighted that that Dalit universe kind of had their bit. i think i think i knew when I wrote, let's say, that cliffhanger, I thought, well, this will kind of get a reaction. And it's a, it's a good cliffhanger. It's a fun cliffhanger. And um, and I thought the reveal is also quite good fun as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, that it, it and that can be nice when you come up with it, when you come up with ideas where you kind of go, I think that's a cool idea. I think that's a cool idea. And, you know, to be fair, I don't think I'm going to write a better cliffhanger than that one at any point. But because uh, it's it's about as big and tarty as they come, but um, you never know. Maybe there'll be something at some point in the future. Every now and then, you kind of have. Mm-hmm. I suppose, yeah. I mean, the closest I came after that is probably Paradox of the Daleks, which has another nice sort of biggish one. But um, I mean, ideas just like that, really. I mean, who knows what the future lies? Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because I I thought that when I did the day of the master cliff, I thought, yeah, this is about the biggest one I'll ever come up with, and it is still pretty big. Mm. But then, yeah, by the time we go, no, that's bigger, isn't it? That's bigger. I mean, speaking of the master. Uh, yes, 
got uh, quite a few people wanting to ask about that, including myself, because I wanted mm. to ask what's uh, the best master, uh, what, what, what's your favourite master story that you've written? Because you've written for the master quite a few times now. And yes. What's your favourite incarnation you've written for? Because you've written oh. for three master stories, you've written for McQueen, you've written for it, a it's... lot. I think I've I think I've covered all of them really. I, well, I haven't done John Sim, but um, Not yeah, I, I, well, and I have, yeah, I've done Eric Robertson. Nearly forgot for what. I mean, I that, that's borderline impossible. I can't. I was trying to figure out because thing is with, with in terms of writing, when mm. I think about kind of if people kind of ask about you, what your favourite script is, go. I kind of don't know after a yeah. while because I, the way the metaphor I kind of try and use to explain it is um, it is is a train with adding little extra carriages to a train. Is if you've got like one in front of you, and the, then another carriage comes along and like shunts it along, and then another one comes along and shunts it along, and eventually, after you've got several of those, those there's there's lots of carriages down that way, yeah. and and it's kind of you kind of know what's happening in the one in front of you, but the further they get into the past, so I used to say something like say from Foe from the Future is one of my favourite stories, and kind of go probably still is to a degree, but I haven't really thought about it for a while. That's kind uh, of but um, but this sort of means that. You know, I was kind of thinking over the list when, when I saw this was a person that came up on Twitter and kind of go, well, you know, I kind of really love doing the two masters. I kind of love the sort of the genre breaking of Requiem for the Rocket Men. Mm-hmm. I love uh, and I, I, I love the Missy ones as well. I think mm-hmm. I, and and the best day of the master I'd say is probably the best. Uh, and again, that's the story where um, on a technical level behind the scenes, I, um, of what I needed to achieve and pull together, and the way it kind of to make the story work. The fact that it's not it's not just quite a good one; it's actually one of my best ones. Um, is borderline miraculous, and a lot of that I'm, I'm not going to lie is luck, because uh, a lot of the time you kind of start writing things and kind of think, I kind of hope this is going to come together, and sometimes the story just kind of happens into the right place. I mean, obviously your brain is doing some of this work. Sometimes you know you, you kind of you're looking for connections and you're spotting things that can happen that you can put together but there are aspects of that where i didn't know what any, any of the details of what that story was going to be when i wrote say better watch out and i left the threads of that available if we wanted to bring come back to them i yeah. wasn't necessarily wedded to coming back to them i thought we can get away with it if we don't um mm-hmm. but when i figured out what's happening in the final one and added the details there's one stage direction in fairy tale of salzburg which was that the transformation at the end was not dissimilar to a regeneration uh, which absolutely fell into what I needed it to be. Yeah. And and the other aspect of it where the story just kind of helped itself along was, again, from that, the fact that um, without even needing to try, I used up the wishes for all three of them. And, and the, the one I needed not to have a wish had had their wish already. And the other two, just getting out of the cliffhanger, worked for one and then the other one. Yeah, it all kind of happened exactly the right spaces I needed them to be. Think, like, um, and the rest of work in a creative process it is a mm. huge part of it, really. Especially writing, you're completely right. It's it is a very luck based process. I mean, obviously, a lot of it comes from imagination. And how mm. how it, at the end of the day, it's all about imagination. But I mean, luck is a huge part of that. Whether it be something that just so happens to happen in your life that just inspires, mm. you know, it, it 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 is a huge part of it. I mean, yeah, you can there's. Right. There's, there's, I think Neil Gaiman talks about this, where he kind of talks about the second draft being the the draft where you try and make it look like you knew what you're doing all the time. Mm. You know? but, but there's also the degree, the first draft, he, this is another quote of his, where he talks about like Wild Coyote running over the cliff. Your job is to not look down, because the moment you look down is the moment you fall. Mm. And I kind of understand that, that the first time you don't know what the story is going to be and you're finding your way through it. And you, you need a certain degree of luck, but there's also kind of like a certain degree of like honing it. And every now and then, yeah, something will happen. You go, oh, that just is perfect the story happens to have fallen in the exact place you need it to without you having had to do anything and other times you have to like absolutely sweat blood to make and there are stories of mine where i've had to sweat blood to make this connect with that and hope in a way that nobody will notice um and but then as i say sometimes the, luck, the lucky stuff will come together and it'll just be sort of effortless and just be and to be fair those are probably the ones i i like the most hmm. um because they, they feel less contrived i can sometimes hear things and think I can see the cogs going. But yeah, so I'd say Dare the Monster is probably the best one. Is that my favourite? I mean, you know, I had a great time writing um, Divorce Beheaded Regenerated hmm. uh, with um, the Monk and, and Missy, which is, I, I suspect that would p- possibly that one would be my favourite just for the sheer kind of joy of um, 
getting those two characters playing off each other. Um, That's amazing. But um, I, it's weird when I kind of think about it. I, I, I'd slightly struggle to like rank any master story I've done below any of the others. It's the bit where I kind of go, I feel I'm very happy with all of them because I think oh, Master of the Daleks is there as well, isn't it? Which, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Master of the Daleks is, is quite, quite good fun. I think that's say the one where I found out how I wanted to write Liv, Nicola Walker's character. There's a specific line about her, like where she sprays the master in his face with perfume to get get away with it. He goes, yeah, yeah. But on the plus side, you smell fantastic, which in my head is like is my like mm. baseline of, of live. That's what she says. That's who she is. I mean, live uh, uh, as a companion as well. I absolutely love live. I mean, all the eight belts of companions, really. I mean, there, but there is another character I would like to talk to you about actually. Uh, yes. Another, uh, I mean, talking to Renegade Time Lords, really. I mean, the collective, the eleven. Oh yeah. The, uh, Twelve. Uh, what's it kind of been like developing that character? Because you've written, you've obviously written for the character quite a lot. What's it been like developing the character as it's kind of gone along? Um, well, it's quite fun. The idea came from uh, David Richardson and Ken Bentley, who kind of pitched the Eleven uh, as an idea for the first Doom Coalition box set. I think, I think even with, I probably can say this now, I think there was a vague idea of bumping him off at the end of the first one and having him regenerate into the Twelve. Uh, but I think when Mark came in and just absolutely nailed it and worked so hard, uh, everyone just went, yeah, I think we kind of need to keep him around a bit. Um, and perhaps weirdly, I, I, I kind of, I think Kenny Smith interviewed me about the 11 for podcast. And I was kind of thinking, I don't think I've got, I didn't write the 11 that much in, in the actual overall scheme of things. Because when I was actually kind of doing the maths on it, I was kind of thinking, I think I'd like one in Doom Coalition 2, I wrote him a cameo in um uh what was it? Uh Scenes from My Life. And then in Doom Coalition 3, he wasn't in. Uh in Doom Coalition 4, yes, some of Stop the Clock. Um mm-hmm. and then yeah, Ravenous, no, no. One episode, and then yeah, so it's it, and, and then a unit, sorry, but there's less of him from me than say the nine who is the one where i absolutely think yeah i write the nine so it's kind of felt like that whilst the the character as a concept was created by david and, and ken the 11 as an individual incarnation probably is a bit more map the nine as an individual incarnation is probably a bit more me um in that i kind of worked out what the character was going to be and figured out from the we'd got the list of who the characters like what all the regenerations were um yeah. And and who they're going to be and what they needed to be throughout, and then uh, so I knew nine was the kleptomaniac, um, and then it was just kind of having fun. With it. I, I do remember us having the conversation in the lead up to Ravenous Four about do we kill him off, and I I think at that point I was thinking I feel yeah that that um, that you could end up getting in a trap of, of just overusing him or bringing him back too much, and I felt that in particular we'd like had him faking being a companion, working with the doctor, and we'd had. A, a multi-collective story, for want of a better term, in uh, um, against and um, yeah, which is a pun. No one ever realised it's a pun. Um, mm-hmm. It's because they are nine and eleven are odd numbers. That's why the yeah. title is that. It's not about odds. Um, yeah, the um, uh, that once I'd done that, and I thought I, I, I thought I've got ten minutes, and I'm going to do every variate, every single joke you could do with this, and try and get it in the ten minutes. So it's the thing. You know the, the the nine within the eleven complementing the nine and, and yeah. the, the, saying things simultaneously. Imagine if you were to get all eleven physical like elevens into the room and they all have the voices in their head complementing each other and like going insane like an entire room full. Yeah. Of... And I, I can't do the maths. I failed the maths you see, but you know something like that that would be. Well, it's, it, it effectively, is is a bit kind of that thing about people say about um, I mean, it would be slightly more, wouldn't it? Because uh, the um. Just imagine if that person did give you all those gifts on those days of Christmas. Mm, mm. You know, I mean, you'd end up with you know twelve partridges, but the amount of things you'd have of the other, you know, that is twelve partridges is more than one person needs, really. <laughs> and twelve pear trees, you'd think I'm fine with just one, one pear tree, one partridge, I'm done. And then you're suddenly going, and now we've got an awful lot of French hens, which is weirdly specific. And um, I mean, gold rings, great. Can we get rid of some of these drummers because they're really annoying me now? <laughs> I mean, it probably like with all of those like gifts in there being completely alive, it probably leads into like some sort of pub brawl, like some sort of bar fight, and half the things in there probably wouldn't be alive by the end of it. 
but, incidentally, my brain is my brain is immediately gone to the place where it's kind of vaguely doing the maths because I realised when I said that I was going to go. Well, there'll be twelve of the first one and twelve of the last one, yeah. and twenty-two of the second one and twenty-two of the, the penultimate one, the eleventh one. Hmm. That would make. And now it's beginning to get to be what thirty and uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be some like mathematical precision because that's like twelve of one, so it goes up ten, then up eight. Mm. But there's presumably it's up six the next time. So there'd be, yeah, so 36. Yeah, this is not, I'm feeling this is not the way we need the conversation to go. Well, it's it? always asking the difficult questions on this show. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, just, certainly my brain just went into, what's the mathematical formula for determining precisely how many there were? Yes. <laughs> oh, maths. I always, always hated maths. It was never for me as a subject. Yeah. So, so basically it's going to be 12 plus 22 plus, <laughs> plus 30 plus 36 plus 40? No, I've lost track. I, no, no. I, I, it feels like this is I'm wasting your time terribly oh, at this point. But plus forty, plus forty-two, plus no, I don't know. Anyway, uh, and times two. Anyway, there we go. We'll, we'll, we'll just write it as an nth amount. That's exactly. Huge. People don't know the math. Exactly. Uh, so another thing, another range I kind of talk to you about that uh, you wrote a story for was Doctor of War, the Unbound. Yes. We talked about the restrictions, the difference between fan and official. Were the restrictions kind of different with an unbound story? Because I can imagine, from like an outside perspective, I can imagine there are some differences in what you can do because of mm. inherent nature. What was it like writing that story and kind of developing that alongside the other writers? Um, well, I think we kind of had lots of sort of discussions about it. I mean, I think, um, yeah, because it was unbound, we could kind of get away with uh, doing things a bit broader. I remember thinking as well, the, the fact that if anything, I feel if it's more a sort of a time war thing than an unbound thing. Um, mm. I, I appreciate people were expecting it to be a bit more sort of what if than it was, but we kind of went in mainly focusing on time war over unbound, if you like. Um, and it, it, it effectively expanding on what an unbound thing could be. But I kind of always feel that I don't want the time war to be too comprehensible, really. I kind of yeah. th think there's, I would kind of encourage people to have bits that kind of don't make sense from a sort of practical human perspective. I um, work and I love that. I think it it really works for the time war, especially in adaptations. I think the time war should be timey wimey by nature, and yeah, as you said, incomprehensible to humans. Yeah, I I I think yeah, I I think that that obviously you kind of want to tell stories that people can kind of follow and make a degree of sense, but um, the the, the it's a it's in a world that's broken, so it shouldn't. I I I don't think it should just be like a a standard war story with Daleks or even a standard Dalek story by any stretch of the imagination. So ideally you should have it kind of bending and twisting in some sort of way in some kind of weird uh, manner. Um, and, you know, and I don't think I've always necessarily achieved that as successfully as I'd like to have done, but there, are, there was somewhere I kind of feel I've done what I want to do with it. Um, yeah. But yeah, a lot of that kind of came with the discussions of, of kind of trying to encourage things to be a bit weirder. So I remember with the key to key to time, Tim's one. Uh, Tim kind of kept feeling delighted at the notes I'd given because he was just going, this just makes it all a bit stranger. Every time we've got a note, it's kind of that bit going, it's amazing. It suddenly gets a bit strange and weird. And and weirdly, and this is, I think this this one has been less discussed. So there is a, I'll, I'll do a fairly major spoiler for the key to key to time. Yeah. So skip over if you haven't heard it. But again, this is another example of, of when I kind of got the script through and there was a moody female president of the Time Lords, I thought, well, we all know who that's going to be. Hmm. Switch it for a guy, and suddenly we don't know who it is, and suddenly it's a surprise. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, I, I think, was one of the things that I was really pleased when I kind of pushed for that slightly, because I think we, uh, I think there was a degree of worry of going, well, we don't have many female parts. It's going, yeah, but we can switch the White Guardian as well, and the White Guardian's a bigger part, so this works out better for everyone. Um, weirdly, yeah, that means that the, the president, who I'm still being very cagey about naming, uh, was a guy I was in Peter Pan with 20 years ago, a guy called Justin Salinger, very good actor, very fine actor, who uh, was Peter Pan when I was one of the Lost Boys at, at the National Theatre in 1999 or something ridiculous like that. Mm. Uh, another question I want to ask about Unbound, is there any like kind of what if uh, question, like what if scenario that you would like to tackle as a writer in future? Of course, you know, not spoiling if you do have any, because I know there are a lot of stuff. That... Oh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything... Right. I mean, the one, the idea I've always wanted, because it was something I thought which didn't quite 
uh, ever get done in the original run is one I kind of thought was was I wanted to do what if Doctor Who wasn't a t- wasn't a, wasn't a science fiction show because mm. um, I thought the idea of of, of a thing called it was going to be called the English Doctor and it was going to be a western huh. uh, where where this sort of traveling English doctor comes to a small town in the middle of the Westfield where there's a sheriff Stuart mm-hmm. and he's being troubled by uh, the Orton boys spelled O R T O N. And and the Autumn Boys are kind of like you know outlaws who are kind of causing trouble and are being assisted by an English uh, minister, who mm. who actually the, this this um, travelling doctor knows and all those sort of things. Where I go, yeah, that I kind of want to do at some point. I mean, to be honest, whilst I say I want to do it, I'm I'm also fully aware of kind of going that that is a hostage to fortune on the accent front. But um, if we're kind of like setting in the same universe as the gunfighters, you know, it's um, but no, I I like that as a as a concept and that's one I wouldn't mind doing. Yeah, that uh, sounds incredible. <laughs> and a lot of thought went into that. I, I expected when I asked that for you to kind of think of something off the top of your head, but... No, but that's that... been the one that's been sat there for ages. Um, and there are various there are various ideas that I, I I have had, but I kind of... There's at least one sort of Rani story I'd want to kind of come up with at some point, which hopefully may happen if anyone can ever figure out who has the rights. Yeah. Um, but that one is too fun for me to like reveal in advance oh, cool. uh it, it, but it's one way of going yeah no that one people would need to find out as it happens because it's a fun i've got like one scene i really i know exactly like some of the details of some of the language the, the stuff in it where it would be fun to do but I mean, um and there are bits and bobs like that all around the place that's the right because that is that the, I, I absolutely love the ronnie big finish stories in, uh, mm. that I've made, and i'd really love for further expansion of that character in particular especially since everyone Everyone is practically asking for the Rani to be back. That's and you see it on Twitter every week. Uh, every new character is that the Rani? Is that the Rani? Who knows? But yeah, um, almost certainly not the Rani as well. I would say definitely with the rights issues as well. Yeah. Uh, it is a shame that with certain characters there are rights issues. I mean, uh, there was uh, something with Doug and I believe that was discussed on the Big Finish uh, podcast where they were talking about Doug and. Right issues potentially with that. I'm not sure if, if my memory's fading there or if that's wrong. But well, the, I mean, Duggan's an interesting one, as I understand, because I'm not entirely. I, I think that might be one. I'm never entirely sure of this. I uh, have this vague notion that Duggan isn't a rights problem, but Scaroth is. I think it's something about. I mean, but I, 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 I say that without having looked into it. But it's something where I think and it, that it might, and if they said it on the podcast, that could be because they've looked into it and figured it out. But at the same time, it might be because people assume it's the same problem as they have discussed, because it's obviously like the Douglas Adams estate and all that sort yeah. of details. Um, yeah, I did at one time consider doing a, a very nearly did a Scaroth City of Death sequel. Um, and I got an idea for that because it, because it was again wanting to find a way of doing a, yeah, I think I can probably, because I'm, I'm, I don't think this is ever going to happen. The, um, the vague idea I had was wanting to bring back Julian Glove because I always thought, what happened to the other splinters? Yeah, because yeah. you, you definitely killed one, but does that mean all of the others die, or what? or something? Or what? And, and I and I was thinking, well, how would you bring back Julian Glove, particularly if it was going to be? I think it was going to be a Tom Baker and Mal of Watery, without really giving away, with making people go, is this you doing? You're doing this, aren't you? And I thought about making him Hercules. Yeah, I, th- I thought you'd have um, Scaroth um, in the Greek era being Hercules with all the sort of the powers that. Because one of the things that people kind of don't realise because of, you know, the more modern adaptations like the Disney film is Hercules in the original stories, not the nicest guy. He's a bit of a jerk. No, not, yeah, not, not, not really nice. But um, yeah, it's an interesting story. I don't, I mean, and an interesting proposition about the personalities because they all influenced history. That was their purpose. Yeah. Yeah, my idea was that, yeah, that they kind of, that, that they potentially were a bit sort of left over and a bit left behind um and and yeah probably and, but yeah i think it would be distracting kind of going if you had julian glover playing an older hercules everyone would go well that kind of makes a degree of sense mm. and they wouldn't necessarily automatically assume that we take a familiar historical figure and make them scour not yeah. historical you know legendary or whatever but um but in a way as i write she's got in the way and it was kind of a bit of relief because there was at least part of me kind of go i like that as a concept i like the idea but oh to write a sequel to that 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 to City of Death, you'd be going, oh, the 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 pressure, the uh, yeah. all of that sort of stuff. It's 
But um, it sounds like a brilliant idea. It sounds like one people would love. I'm moving away from Big Finish now because there's another question. Yes. And, um, I, I looked on the website for your podcast and uh, listened to a bit of an episode. I've got to listen to more because I'm definitely interested. Uh, the, your favorite film is listed as The Apartment, the film that yeah. I've seen that's also on my list now. But I mm-hmm. thought it's definitely one I'm interested in. What, what films would you recommend to people in general and people who want to work within the creative industry? Oh, goodness me. That's 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 a vast question. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, well, I think as as wide a range as possible. This is, I suppose, the thing that I always say. Um, but um, the, in terms of working in the in the creative industry, I think I would always be like astonished when I was at drama school about that there were people who didn't particularly like you know plays or read plays um, uh, because I feel that having a sense not just of the creative industry but a sense of what is out there and what is sort of exciting and different yeah. um is is incredibly helpful mm-hmm. um it, it, that you will never know where inspiration will come from just having a very wide range it's like i remember actually years ago doctor who magazine i just asked i certainly want to write for doctor who and at least one of the things they were suggesting was like try and want to write things other than doctor who because that would kind of give you a broader sense of it and a broader range of things so i get more inspiration from other series and shows than doctor who itself um but yeah, I, I I think if I what I would recommend is kind of like being trying to be as sort of widely read and uh, viewed for want of a better term uh, as as you can. So as big a range. I know that there's. I remember like talking to people who kind of view. And to be fair, this kind of feels a bit like it to me that seeing something black and white, for example, can almost feel like oh, it's a bit like homework, isn't it? But then you watch them kind of go, oh my god, no, they're just amazing. So the apartment, every even though it's my favorite film, every, every even like putting on, it kind of go, oh, I mean, it's, it, is is it that good? And then I watch it go, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really good. And Casablanca is another one where Casablanca, you kind of go, I mean, yeah, it's a bit like hard work, isn't it? Right? Oh no, God, it's hilarious and brilliant and heartbreaking and just and yeah, it, it, it the just just trying to get as wide a, a, a variety as you can mm, is I, I think kind of important uh one thing uh one uh one sort of uh program my well not program but uh that my uh uni recommend my i uh, go to screen and film school around brighton uh they recommend bfi player as a good oh yeah uh, watching things and uh I uh, when I went and saw Evil of the Daleks in the BFI, that was when I kind of discovered the BFI and kind of thought, wow, this is a great place to kind of. It's go a great resource, yeah. Uh, see stuff and uh, widen kind of my palette of films and TV, which, as you say, is it's very important. Um, and and I think you mentioned earlier when you watch films with your mates and you watch, uh, and with other professionals in the industry, of course. Uh, it's like you watch films that you like and you don't like, and I feel like that is just as mm. uh, both are just as important as each other. Really, finding that kind of yeah. balance, and you can get great ideas from watching something that's rubbish because because there's always at least part you kind of go, well, why doesn't this work, and how would I make it work, and what's a better version of this? Yeah. Um, and then just yeah, seeing things across genres. I always, I mean, also as well, I I, I kind of think that. Uh, mix it up a bit i like to kind of read um a wide variety of genres but also and, and like watch films of a wide variety of guys but i always like to mix it up mix a match so you can have like a booker prize winner followed by an airport novel just to try and uh because they're I, I wouldn't want to just like watch the bfi mm. sight and sound top 100 poll because yeah. you get you, you occasionally you just want to sit down and watch a fast and the furious movie for crying out loud it's just um and and they're all useful things to to have a sort of a a a wide ranging palette, I would say. So, um, uh, and so you can be influenced by everything from sort of highbrow to lowbrow, really. And and because highbrow is not automatically good, and lowbrow is not automatically bad. And you know, all, at the end of the day, it's all subjective. I mean, it's it's all about kind of finding what uh, your interest yeah. in. I mean, as, as I, I jokingly mentioned, the Vars and the Virus, but that is an interesting series to watch. Maybe up until about number eight. Number nine was about the point where even I found myself going and going, "Yeah, this might have jumped the shot." Yeah. But uh, when 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 they actually go into space, it's just this point where kind of going, "Yeah, it's a bit mission done." That's a bit. Oh like, yeah, that's a yeah. bit like too extreme for. Uh, yeah, I I I I like it extremely. I like the Vars and the Virus series extreme, but it gets to a point. 
for just a point. But I, I, suppose... I think I think when I, I think as well, it's also when the guy from Tokyo Drift turns up as a rocket scientist. You kind of go, I mean, I mean, really? That's what we've gone with, is it? Tokyo Drift. I kind of love the fact it is the Tokyo Drift guy, but uh, at the same time, it's it's a bit kind of like, yeah, this is getting I... very very insane now. I like the idea of the more insane elements being saved for spin-offs like Hobbs and Shaw. I feel like that's a that's a good idea, kind of dedicating like space and more like uh what what I can't really remember the plot. It was an Idris Elbow kind of super Oh, it's like a cyborg or something. I mean I haven't seen yeah. that one. I keep meaning to get into it, but it's sort of um yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds insane, but insane enough for kind of a spin off than to kind of end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, let's face it; it's got nothing to do with family. So uh, there's there's only so kind of de- much of that detail you can have in it. Yeah, yeah, but I, I completely agree with everything you said. And um, talking of genre, because of course, I mean, you write for me. Uh, we'll yes. watch a show that's very. It's not really genre specific, not too, although obviously as the overarching theme of science fiction. Uh, yes. New pure historicals superhero episode. Yes. Yeah appear fancy what's your kind of favorite genre when it comes to doctor who i mean there's also horror as well which is big one. do you think there's any genre that wouldn't work the show because hmm, i've asked people that question and it always yeah i mean i mean as i say i i like i like the mix of genre i guess so and it, it kind of depends you know what what mood you're in really i mean i i i i can like it being a bit more sort of dark and Hinchcliffe horror, and then I can like sort of the sort of the poppy colourfulness of, of uh, like McCoy. Um, but uh, I don't know. I I, 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 I mean, it's, the City of Death is my probably my favourite story. So potentially by definition, is something with that kind of lightness of tone. But then I'd be throwing out of an entire. I suppose where it comes down to, I think the fact for me is that part of the joy of Doctor Who is that it isn't constrained to one specific genre. Yeah. That you can have something that's really dark and straight, and I and I will like to mix it up a bit. So I'll kind of go, oh, I haven't written a scary one in a while. Let's attempt a scary one. I haven't written a funny one in a while. Let's do a funny one, and then hopefully kind of be led by that. Um, I I I mean, I'm I'm struggling to think of a genre I don't think it could do. Yeah, uh, I think there is a degree to which. And, and I, but I think we've even got better at this now. That the idea that uh, I remember somebody said years ago that Doctor Who could go anywhere and do anything, tell any story with any genre. That heaven help you if you do that, uh, because sometimes there will be a massive backlash if it's like, oh, this is silly and unworthy of the diamond logo or some nonsense like that. Um, but I think we've got better, particularly with the more recent series where you know. Russell Yeoves came in in 2005 with a, a bit more lightness of touch and a bit more kind of fun and frippery. Yeah. But then, but even then, again, the mixture of tones that you can have and then the Moffat stuff could be darker. And it, it's, I, I think people bought into that a bit more in the idea and, and the more modern fandom, I think, is less wedded to. I, I would always used to have this idea that, um, and I think this is really like resonant in a lot of the sort of fan polls, of particularly like the wilderness years, the Doctor Who fans were kind of really against we were a bit embarrassed about the fact it was often referred to as a family series or a kids series. And so would veer towards their favourites being the things that were nominally adults. So quite violent, quite dark. And, also Victoriana yeah, uh, and, and historical stories because the sets looked more convincing. So anything where you kind of think, I wouldn't feel embarrassed watching this in front of a room with other people. And things yeah. that they perceive being embarrassing like jokes and lightness. Um, I think that will kind of fed into things. Whereas I kind of think ultimately, you know, I'm a bit more embarrassed about seeing something like, I don't know, you know, Resurrection of the Daleks than I would be about see, seeing the Happiness Patrol. I uh, kind of, I, I, I kind of love, I, I, I very much embrace the wobbly sets and the mm. charm of Doctor Who is very much in that. And like, it's not a perfect show. It never has been. Mm. It, it's, it, it, no show is perfect. And I think there's a lot of charm. In like when when Duggan knocks down the wall in City of Death and you can see the entire wall shaking, yeah, his charm. That is like, and and I and I also like Resurrection of the Daleks myself because I do I, I like that more serious nature, you know, less mm. bots, but I think there's charm in both, and I think it's I think yeah. the music the found balance. I think you're right in that. Um, it, it definitely, uh, even so, I mean, uh, I I think it, it was less, uh, especially later on. Got less afraid of backlash. I think. Uh, well, Sirius mm. One isn't afraid to do what it wants to do. Not no no yeah. afraid at all, and I love that. 
but uh, I think Moffat's Christmas specials in particular, because we had Santa appearing, we had yes yeah. episode. I think that I I love it when the show embraces how bonkers it can be. While also, mm. I mean, the, the Santa appearing in Last Christmas, that episode is played completely straight, and I yeah. love it because you just have Nick Frost in the Santa outfit walking around, but the episode itself is very it's, dark. Yeah. No, oh, I love that. I I love it. I, yeah. I I think you're completely right. And as for genres that don't work for the show, I mean, some haven't been attempted yet. Uh, but we'll, we'll never. I have. think I think there are some subjects and areas you probably shouldn't touch yeah. on. Yeah. Um, but particularly, you know, on the basis that, um, the Doctor is, and the, the the kind of the inherent silliness of the premise and the time travel aspect of it could seem a bit crass placed mm. next to some things that are genuinely incredibly serious yeah um and uh, you know and and kind of put the doctor in too much in in the line of real world atrocities and it begins to like ask the question of saying well why didn't they stop xyz or whatever and in my humble opinion i think the only time for me that doctor has kind of verged on that was let's kill hitler but i do expect <laughs> that the episode in itself is kind of a deconstruction of that point like the doctor should not be here yeah the whole episode is based around that and i kind of like that uh but i think that uh, it was a very difficult balance to walk on that episode and i feel like they did succeed but yeah I, yeah i i didn't think it yeah i i, I didn't find myself uncomfortable watching it it's kind of it, it's it, i'd say i think you're right it's about the closest i think doctor has ever got to that um and but, when they were planning to do Doctor Who and the Nazis during the 60s, but cut it for that very reason, that too soon and too insensitive. Yes. That was very much, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think there is, yeah, there are, there are various real things in real life, actual, there, there's got to be a degree to which Doctor Who is always a bit escapist. Mm. Um, and I think weird, I suppose you can kind of get away with the fact with the let's get Hitler possibly, you know, the fact that Hitler is there Things like Indiana Jones and the, the Last Crusade and things like that, where where it's almost, if anything, with Hitler, there's something about including these things to um, weaken him in a way. Yeah. Um, in, in that you know, it's a effectively you know humiliating and 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 rich. Yeah, but I, I there are things that yeah I don't think you should probably touch, or if you do, you need to do it with the any level of care that I I oh, think. Yeah. More beyond human capabilities, really. I think another example, really, uh, was from the Virgin Novel Adventures. Uh, mm. you, I, I, I love that series. I think it's great. I think it's a mm. great Doctor Who in there. I do think, and it was obviously a very different target audience, which does need to be factored mm. in the conversation about it, but there were points where it does go way, way too far in the wrong, like, Direction of mm. one. there was uh, it was like one of the timeworms I haven't read it in a while but it, it did focus on, I think it was I think it was Terence Dix who wrote it uh but he he, he was uh he wrote about the Nazis and it was like there was a moment where the uh the story ponders whether there are in any alien involvement I believe in in their rise to power yeah at that point you gotta and their atrocities at that point you kind of gotta think and that's a bit that's, That's bit... not ideal, so yeah. So, uh, and for everyone watching, as I just explained to John, uh, I burnt my hand the other day because student life and student mistake uh, burnt my hand by cooking in the oven. And uh, yeah, went right through the oven glove and uh, caused a blister right here. I don't know if you can see it on camera. It should be red. Kind of looks like a grape. Anyways, <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I've got a question for you now. Uh, it's sort of what industry professionals did you look up to? Uh, while kind of going into well into the industry uh, whether that be in an acting capacity and a writing capacity oh I mean there are various people who kind of uh, leap out I mean the uh, the big sort of life changing one was was Harold Pinter like as a writer even though Harold Pinter the, you know the further we get away you kind of go oh, to those plays a tiny bit problematic um, he's potentially a bit of a misogynist it's very hard to tell um, but um yeah, the, in terms of the, the the dialogue and the way you use dialogue, that was something I got kind of obsessed by. And um, first plays I wrote were just bad versions of that. 
Um, but eventually I sort of figured out what my own voice was and uh, but that kind of gave me an in to kind of working that out. Also, I'd probably go for Alan Akeborn as well as, as, a, as a writer. Alan Akeborn is monstrously underrated, I think. Um, uh, he's, because he's quite populist and, and, yeah. and liked, which people kind of think, I think, tend to assume is, means that the stuff's good. It's kind of a bit like ABBA. Where occasionally people are like really dismissive of ABBA because they're going, kind of, oh, because they're quite sort of widely pop popular, and I just go, actually, if you kind of analyse it, they're quite sort of complex and and yeah. high quality pieces. I, I mean, Aikman is an interesting because you know he's been writing for decades, and and the gold stuff is really kind of like the seventies to about two thousand, um, uh, uh, and again within that, some more than others. But it was really interesting. I did a tour of Absurd Person Singular a few years ago, watching the rest of the cast gradually fall in love with them, having not really kind of known more than just like a few of the later ones. Like, oh, it's like, what is it? And then realising that this play was really good. Mm. Um, just a, a, an absurd sort of bleak, strange piece. Um, uh, was kind of impressive. Actor-wise, I always like adored Ian Holm. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, various other actors kind of leap out at me as kind of being people I really adored, like sort of Bob Peck. Um, uh, but not necessarily people I kind of was influenced by it as such because you kind of always wanted to sort of be your own thing. Um, yeah, to be, to be honest, though, you know, it feels terribly long ago now, though most of it, so I can't really remember kind of that many. But, you know, I just liked seeing actors in plays and TV and yeah. enjoying a lot of these things. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, for one thing, uh, at uh, Screen Film School, I'm attending, we have to, uh, we had split up into uh, several, um, several different. Uh, lessons several different um subjects to teach us yeah uh, one of them is called the creative industry and you and yeah. we have to write about our journey from uh we have to write about our journey networking inspirations and mm -hmm. uh, you know just general everything that kind of relates to us it can be quite intrusive at times but it is a nice part of the course most of the time yeah so uh, and yeah i mean um it, it and uh it particularly led to me forming a lot of questions for this actually because i really do enjoy that and you just happened to have come up in uh quite a few of mine uh when i was writing uh my essay for that in particular um i mean uh mainly because i mean the dot you right it's very it's incredible for one i love oh, it thank you, uh, yes. uh, i think it was you and rusty davis who come up in mine quite a lot and uh, uh i mean any dot family looks up to rusty davis i mean uh, yes but yeah, yes. so I thought I'd ask you a few questions that they asked me, such as, what's it kind of like uh, networking for you now? And what was it like when you first started kind of networking? Oh, I mean, I'm I'm terrible at networking. Like a lot of writers, I'm, I'm, I'm massively uh, awkward um, in, in, in social situations. I, 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 I suppose I, I'm kind of bullish now about like emailing people and, um, and, and, and sort of getting in touch. But uh, yeah, because I, th I think we're sort of getting through the opening hurdle is always a kind of the trickiest thing for mm -hmm. anyone. Even like with the amount of scripts I've got on, on the back, I'm always a little bit kind of reserved and not wanting to kind of. Um, but occasionally, if you feel you've kind of got something worthwhile uh, to contribute, it's always worth kind of um, not holding back. I've got to find it interesting. I would occasionally like um, look over my sister's CV. She's kind of like setting out for a job. And the one, the big kind of detail I would always remember with hers uh, that kind of establishes things was. Um, uh, was, was it would say things like, well, I feel I've got the right uh, set of skills for this. Um, I, I think I could do this job to everyone. And I was kind of having to point out going, going, why have you put those first two words every time? Why is it I feel this? Why is it I think this? I've got this right. So it's already you're being ever so slightly kind of like going, mm -hmm. maybe I don't. Um, actually, it was really weird. I, I went to a thing a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I was filming like the, the tiniest borderline, not, well, in fact, it was non-speaking part in a film by um, the delightful Joy Wilkinson, yeah. writer of The Witch Finders, amongst other things, um, uh, who I know a little bit. Um, and whilst I was sort of waiting to go and play um, a tramp under a, under a railway arch, um, one of the production staff there was, was drafting a letter to send to someone she had met with. Um, and... And she was kind of trying to like test out and, and some of the producers said, well, you do realise that this guy's a writer over here? And, and he went, yeah, yeah, I'll have a look at it. And I'd look at it. And I think she ended up changing the entire letter. 
um because i suppose yeah in terms of like general networking thing, it's always that beginning never, never kind of apologize for it because you like literally start the email so say well i don't imagine anything will ever come of this and you're having this bit of go go why are, you, why are you sending that? well one why are you sending that why are you sending that because it's basically implied well you said get because he this guy had literally said send me your cv and and she go well i don't imagine anything will come of it. you go go well are you just saying are you calling him a liar are you, are you kind of saying, you, you, I'm, I'm, are you automatically saying, well, look, actually, I'm a bit rubbish. I have this bit go, no, why are you even bothering to send an email if, you, if, if you're saying, I don't imagine anything will come of this? Don't apologise for it, just go straight in, all of that sort yeah. of stuff. So, I, and, but I think we all kind of know these things, but occasionally are guilty of being, yeah. So it, it's, yeah, that's, that, that's probably a roundabout that has his answer for you there. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with all of it. I mean, the way they, took, the way they teach us it in kind of... Uh film screen school really well well the tutor kind of described it is that it does feel like targeting people it does feel like you're putting a target on someone and you've got to go for it no matter whether you fail or succeed you've just got to go in a full confidence and look, i've had a fair share of experience networking by now i mean i, I used to really apologize really apologize every yeah. sentence start off with oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry for bothering you i'm sorry i mean it it's not yeah it, 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 it's like it it feels polite to apologize, but they're not they're not gonna yeah. read it and hear your Well response. that's a... it's like if if they're interested, they're interested. If they're not yeah. no to apologize. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, because it's it's um yeah, it's sort of well, it's kind of weirdly expected. Hold on, I'm making a mess of pouring my tea. Yeah, uh, it's got some a weirdly expected thing, you know, even on my limited level of being able to do anything, which is quite low. Um, people will still sort of email me and I kind of, I'm, I'm never bothered by that because, um, well, not least because I'm, I'm going to be doing it myself some of the time. And, um, and it's just something we're going to go, yeah, I appreciate that this is a perfectly fine thing for people to do. So no one ever has to apologize for that. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I will probably apologize for the fact that I, I'll, I'll have got this one. I'm out. So I thought, oh, I should probably deal with that and then forget about it for four months because <laughs> again, a deficit. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting part of the industry to discuss because it, everyone does it, everyone does it, everyone has to do it. It's it's a key part, and it can lead to great opportunities, amazing opportunities, and some people just just don't, you know. Uh... I, I'd say if if there is one sort of vague tip I might have, because I think part again, this is like going back twenty years, of part of the thing that kind of worked worked it for me is is almost that bit of of, of kind of timing your moment a bit. So it is that part of, of like, you know, well, let's say we look like sort of met at the BFA bar, bar or whatever, and you kind of go, if you if, if everyone was there kind of like, can I hand you my CV and here's my doctor's story, then it's probably a bit the wrong kind of time. I think it's almost always better if, to kind of, because um, I partially got in to doing the acting by bumping into Gary Russell at a convention. And the very last thing I wanted to do at that convention was actually like hand in my CV or anything, because I was going, I'm actually quite enjoying we get on quite well. This is fine. We're having a nice conversation. That that immediately then turning it into a business opportunity um, mm. feels wrong. Having said that, occasionally I think it can kind of go the other way, where the other person goes, "You know what? I'm, I'm, you're fine. Let, let's, let's, I, pre- I, I will offer to do it or something like that for whatever reason." Where it's that bit going, "Yeah, that's that. I can." Uh, the, the other side can be the proactive bit in that in that scenario a bit. I think that can be useful. Mm-hmm. But remember, you're talking to a person, not um, not no. a business. Yeah. I mean, funnily enough, I was just about to bring up Gary Russell, actually, because I, I think in terms of networking, uh, when, when when I asked him to be on the podcast was at the BFI, because he, he, he mm. went a while back, and I remember like that was probably the first kind of sort of daunting kind of, it was kind of like the first push like in-person uh, networking that I did. Uh, and I remember just rambling and rambling and then asking because I had no experience. Obviously, very sweet, uh, agreed to come on and we had a lovely conversation. But uh, it was, it, it it can be very daunting for people, I think. That, it, well, it can be. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it, I think it's something that develops as people grow as creatives. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as well, the other thing pretty much was saying is remember, we're all just human beings. Everyone is a human being. and 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 the worst that can happen is that they'll, say no or they will um ignore your email either by forget getting it or being or, or deliberately going on oh, no i don't have the time to reply to that and it's not of any interest and that's sort of fine i mean it, it, it also, it, but even then it's like kind of i, I think i like 
wasn't getting seen for job somewhere and decided to send an email, I kind of go, well, it's not like they can not see me twice. Yeah, exactly. You know, already not seeing me. What's it? Yeah, it. it, it I, I, I think uh, you, you're generally dealing with people, and a lot of the people in the creative industries are kind of willing to help and be positive. Not all of them, by any stretch of the imagination, but um, you know, it's um, yeah, just kind of worth constantly putting yourself out there. I think, yeah. And, uh, here's a random topical question. Uh, something I just noticed. How do you take your tea? <laughs> Probably um, not a question I can ask. Just, just milk. Um, I have a lot of sweeteners or sugars or caramel syrups in coffee. But mm. tea, when I was growing up, my folks drank tea. Never really drank coffee, drank tea. And they weaned themselves off coffee, off, sorry, off, off sugar and tea. Yeah. Um, so that when me and my sister would say, oh, can we try that? We wouldn't get the taste of it. And so I've never had, uh, so it's always quite sort of milky-ish. Well, actually not that milky, it's quite brown. But depending on what it is, because I kind of usually have maybe a chai or something a bit odd in the morning and then standard tea in the end. And occasionally, if I'm feeling in the mood, um, if I'm writing Doctor Who, which I have been doing today, um, I specifically uh, go for a, like a Doctor Who themed, yeah. I don't have I've a... given these all the damn time. So yeah. not these mugs specifically, but yeah. Oh, that's love. Oh, that's impressive. Yes. Which yeah, would... I mean, you might even. I'm, I mean, even even to the degree where I've got. As I, say, I I don't buy these things, but this was like literally the kettle I've got at the moment. Mm. The, the teapot, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm gonna top that up a bit. Most of my Doctor Who themed mugs came from when they used to do Easter eggs back. Oh yes. Ten years, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Yeah. Every time I remember how long ago, the David Tennant, Matt Smith, Christopher Eccleston. Yeah, it's 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 long. Goldie was longer than I thought it was the other day. It just feels like it was even like Whitaker was a year ago. That, yeah, I feel like sometimes I register my age by what Doctor Who was on at the time. Well, I mean, yeah, I was. I, I I can get a definite sense of how long ago. Um. The, the tenant was because I was writing my very first Doctor Who audios pretty much at the time he was leaving. So I think mm. I I think I just maybe finished a draft of Solitaire when Waters of Mars happened. Mm. So uh, it's as long ago as that. Oh. Yeah. So um, an another random question I've written down in the past, just because I I sometimes like to throw in a wild card question, but if you like cheese, what is your favourite cheese? <laughs> oh um oh crikey. No, I do adore cheese, cheddar probably, though I do love a Stilton and occasionally an Emmental. Uh, but to be fair, I'm not going to say no to any cheese. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, my, cheese is great. My favourite, probably Red Leicester, actually. I, I, I did get um, a blood test a few years ago where they, they, they said, you know, I should probably ha eat a bit less cheese. Um, as a result, of, and you kind of go that make to me, to be honest, my friends thought that sounded like I've got too much cheese in my blood, and I thought this makes it sound like I'm a stuffed crust pizza, <laughs> just with the veins and cheese, and it's yeah. I've I've still eat about as much cheese to be honest. I should probably be careful. Yeah. Oh, the the blister's got on a bit, just a probably a bit more painful. Oof. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, cheese on my end. I mean, I've been trying to try more recently. I mean, um, yeah. I, I prefer stronger cheeses when melted, really. I mean, uh, usually, mm -hmm. I, I like goat's cheese on pizza. Goat's cheese yeah. on pizza, burgers, a bit of a steak. It's lovely. I mean, uh, but usually unmelted or melted is Red Leicester. Yeah. I, I would say that, yeah, generally, the stronger, the better for me. That is always, mm -hmm. I like a strong cheese. Um, my, my gran used to have, the, like, the mildest cheddar imaginable. I was like, I was going, this is just rubber. That's all this is. Yeah, I mean... um. What's your least favourite then? Oh, um, I mean, I'm not sure I do. I mean, probably you know, it'd be something like a like a Dairyly Triangle or a Baby Bear, where it barely counts as an actual cheese. But yeah. even then, even then, I'd I'd turn it down if somebody offered me it. Yeah, fair. With, fair. But, you know, our, our least favourite cheese is still kind of quite high on the favourite food ranking. That's it. I I respect that highly. <laughs> Like so, least favorite episode of Forty Towers. I mean, you're still you're still kind of you're still Forty Towers. It, exactly, yeah, exactly. I know. Um, it's away. the anniversary, but yeah, was yeah. it was an anniversary. Is it wedding party? The wedding party for reference. Yeah, I I just I just don't buy that he wouldn't tell them what had happened. Anyway, carry on. Well, another question that goes back to something we discussed at the BFI actually was we were we were kind of discussing 
um, you know, like human characteristics with the Doctor and how I didn't really like the Doctor as a bloke, like a mm -hmm. like footy go down the pub. Yeah, that that sort. Of. Are there any other like characteristics or like human traits or like human contexts that you couldn't really see the Doctor in? Like you wouldn't want to write the Doctor in? I imagine. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I kind of again i think the doctor is potent has got so much potential of being borderline anything hmm. that i i don't know i always thought that you know when i was an actor i thought well if ever i play the doctor i'd kind of i i i, I the, had this vague idea that i always got a bit fed up with the idea of him talking about oh, i'm a bit mad me that kind hmm. of like like kind of a bit gary davis radio dj type thing where kind of going no no i'd actually wanted to be like almost dangerously insane like properly not not a bit wacky lager commercial bad but actually properly dangerous but um but even then that sort of uh I, I i think i think the character could borderline be anything i always think i mean the thing i find intriguing with him as a character but slash her um still mentally always a, a tiny bit of a processing um is that i i think it it the, the the doctor is effect in effect not a leading role that's how i tend to view it i think that it is uh, in any other series, the Doctor would be the 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 leading character's wacky best mate, which is why Shooting Gatwa seems like such an amazing choice because that is literally what he is in Sex Education. Yeah. Um, and it, it, because it's that kind of performance where it's just no one's told this character they're not the lead, and so I I I, I think it, if anything that I wouldn't expect, it would be a more conventional leading figure. Mm. Um. It was actually kind of like, like straightforwardly heroic. I suspect so. That's kind of, almost anything else. Yeah. You know, I feel, you know you could do without you know as, as long as it's basically you know conforming to all the sort of the moral morals and values of the character. Then I think um, I'd kind of struggle to see it as, as sort of anything like that. That's why I think it's why I think you probably couldn't get away with him being too sort of blokey bloke because again that to, to actually like portray that would be involving kind of doing things that veer a bit away from the doctor as we are used to then yeah. um it's um yeah funnily enough i think that's like perfectly aligned with like the ninth and tenth doctor because when the tenth doctor is on his own in the latter half of his era and he does try being you know the main on his own no one else around there to influence him he does mm. go down a very dark path and he becomes something that's eventually kind of not sort of doctor like but sort of master like in the world uh the waters of yeah sort of like, even like the monk even sort of like a very dark interpretation like oh i can do anything i can alter yes yeah. just for the hell of it just to save the little people once he's on his own once he's not the funny goofy side character um he kind of just yeah he just goes down a very dark path and the ninth doctor he I think Rose kind of saves the day more in his era than he does. It, or like the side characters, he inspires the people around him to save the day uh, in series one yeah. of time. And yeah, I, I, I love that outlook of him being the kind of, that kind of, in any other series, he'd be the goofy side character or like mm. the best mate that's a bit quirky. But yeah, um, my uh, next question uh it's sort of like what's your earliest memory with the show what's your uh... oh um it was i know exactly what it was it was weirdly the very beginning of episode one of an unearthly child and i know that i'm just i'm, like I'm too young and that's because i am it's because it was when it was repeated in the five faces of doctor who oh. uh season in 1980 and my memory i can't be 100 percent sure is i think it must have been like my folks going oh they're showing the first episode of doctor who should we watch that decided to switch over I got scared by the beginning and we switched over. And then I might think we might switch back and just caught right at the end of episode one. And then we didn't watch any of it for the next, like, how, I, I don't think it was showing weekly. So it might have been like a couple of episodes a week. So maybe, however many weeks it took until the, the very first one I actually saw properly was Carnival of Monsters, mm -hmm. uh, which was repeated um, a short while afterwards. And I distinctly remember bits of that. Weirdly, I told this to a friend and they kind of didn't quite believe me and I had to look it up. Uh, the, the Carnival of Monsters was followed by three doctors, which is the wrong way round. Yeah. Um, so it's like they did one, two, three, and then all three. Um, and then I remember watching the three doctors and then Legopolis afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, but the, the, even that, only it's like the memory cheats. So I have a distinct memory 
or I had a distinct memory. I've watched the actual proper show a bit more recently enough, so I know it's not there. But I still can't quite believe that Omega taking his hat off mm. and and having no head underneath wasn't a cliffhanger. In my head, that's a cliffhanger. Yeah, and to yeah, be fair, yeah. it did better than most of the cliffhangers in The Three Doctors. So... Yeah. Uh, the Three Doctors cliffhangers were... Yeah, they were interesting. They were... Two of them are basically the thing... Something goes... Gets transmitted into the antimatter universe. And the other one is the Doctor kind of gets throttled by some weird imaginarium alien or whatever it is. Yeah, I still don't quite understand that. But I think it was like Omega's physical form or like his mental projection. Oh, some sort of, yeah, wrestler projection type thing. It's all a little bit weird. Like that. I still love it. I lo- It's once again embracing Doctor Who for being bonkers. And... Oh, it's good fun. I, I watched it again and was struck by how entertaining it is. It's a thoroughly enjoyable couple of hours. Oh, yeah. I mean, my earliest memories of the show, I think there's one I can remember kind of, I, I like had dreams of it as a kid was like, or like nightmares. Because uh, this scene in particular would scar a child. Uh, it was like, I was like in like my cot or something like that. And uh, the doctor and, well, I didn't know it was the doctor at the time. Didn't know it was Doctor Who. So these two characters had just turned into birds. Um, which of course is Vengeance on Varus. Wow. Which, yeah. Realised was Doctor Who until like, 16 years later when I watched Vengeance on Pharos and realised uh, wow, this was Doctor Who. Where on earth did you see that? I I don't know. It was like through like, you, you know, like you have those play areas which are like cornered off by like these sort of uh, I think through that I had seen it on like a repeat or something on the Wow. Floor. And like I remember that scene in particular and, and it's just it was just like a vivid sort of memory that I hmm. kept for so long. And then I remember, and then I watched Doctor Who and realised, wow, this is Doctor Who. I, I always thought my first kind of encounter with it was Series 1, when it revived. Yeah. Because uh, obviously that's when I probably started watching when I was around 2, 2, 3. Um, never stopped watching since, which is the joy of it. But yeah, I, I have tons of vivid memories. One, one that particularly stands out, well, there's two. Um, one is when I was particularly very young, was watching the Shakespeare Code with my dad and I was like sat mm. in front of him watching it on like the small four by three TV in the kitchen mm. uh, and then one was the week in between the Stolen Earth and Journey's End which I will never forget that week because that I mean yeah. that uh, yeah uh, I remember like I was sitting by my kitchen door to the outside garden playing my figures trying to figure out how he could survive tons of small memories like that um even Remembrance of the Dalek cliffhanger I watched when I was very, very young. Um, I'm not sure if I watched that before Dalek, actually, so I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, uh, moving on to my next question. I've uh, oh, What was your earliest film memory as well? That was another thing. Oh, that's you know, enough. that's a tricky one. Probably, I mean, the, I, I mean, I remember watching Star Wars a lot as a kid. Mm. Um, to the degree where I was, I would have to be quite young. I don't know if it's literally the first thing I remember seeing, but it's is the yeah I, I i recall watching i couldn't necessarily pin down what the first thing i ever saw was but it's it's something like that i i would um have these long walks to to school with my mum and i would recite her the entire plot and in fact like all the dialogue because i'd memorized it and watched it that often mm-hmm. and then because i was an evil genius i'd like quiz her when i got to then so she couldn't like switch off uh i'd also make up stories and do that so you know having dealt with nephews and a sort of stepchild um yeah it's very much um yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a um a, the thing where i go i was very evil because yeah the the last thing you want to do is listen to the nonsense they come out with <laughs> yeah. i don't care about minecraft really don't care about minecraft so um or zelda i don't know any of the, you're saying words that mean nothing to me <laughs> my, my flatmate's been playing Zelda recently. It's amazing, actually. It is proper. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's good, but it's something I know nothing about. So a child talking about it to me for 20 minutes, where you're going, I have no frame of reference for anything you're saying. I I'm think... sure this is terribly exciting and good, but, you know. I think that was uh, me with Doctor Who a lot of the time growing up. Yeah. Non-stop, and it didn't, it hasn't stopped. I mean, yeah, it still is for me. I'll just explain plots to people. Go, this is amazing. This is exciting. This is what happens. And I go, right, okay. Can yeah. I just go now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I know a lot of people that understand that. But yeah, stop me. Doesn't stop me. I mean, um, 
even like um even like when I'm with my flatmates now and I'm introducing them to the show, uh, we we just got through series five two months ago before the we're having a break at the moment. Um, and it's been it's been particularly interesting them watching them kind of watch it and then realize how much I reference it or like how much that sort of how much Doctor Who kind of comes out in normal conversation. Like whenever I uh, say well, uh, in it, it does go accidentally tenant sometimes, and then they yeah. all go well, uh, which is very much yeah, well. it, yeah. I think <laughs> it, it's 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 fun. It's it, it, it yeah. But uh, my next question as well. Uh, what story of yours would you use to introduce people to Big Finish if you had to pick? Oh, a um, weirdly, I was kind of thinking about that. Um over the weekend because yeah I was, I was potentially going to have to do that and ended up not having to do it but yeah um infamy of the zaros easy um because it's um quite fun quite fast got an entertaining plot it's got people that they'll be familiar with in it mm. you know um and not just tenant and you know and, and and piper there's a you know there's a good chance they might be aware of you know rosie cavaliero and guy henry and different mm. versions of formats um and yeah it, it's fast it's fine it, it, i'm pretty happy with it. it and i don't think you really need to know that much about the continuity really um yeah it's one i i i think is a, it's a genuinely a bit of a hoot and uh yeah not my all-time favorite but it's still one where i'm going i'm really happy with that one and yeah i think that one i agree with that i agree that's a great great place to start i mean um and w- would you agree that that's kind of like introducing to your work in particular would you kind of use that as someone to introduce to your well, side i mean I suppose, yeah, just on the basis, I mean, on the basis I'm really familiar with my work, so I kind of know what would be kind of a good, yeah, because that was specifically to, like, somebody was interested in hearing some of my stuff, so, but then I, I feel that it's not the worst jumping on point for, for anyone, really, um, and, yeah, because I, I was thinking about other people's stuff, then I, I'm just less familiar with it. I'm just less familiar, because obviously I spent, you know, even stuff I've scripted, edited, I've spent less time on it than I've spent thinking about the ones I've done. Um, I mean, th- there are, there's nothing, there's something to be said for like going on Spotify and just like doing the first 50 in order. Um, and, uh, or somewhere like the, you know, the um, Lucy Miller stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. Anything. That, but, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I think is kind of pretty accessible. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, it's just finding what's good, really. You've written a lot. I mean, even in your bio, you've written, you've state that you've written more Doctor Who than you care to count. Yes. What's it like looking back at the quantity of your work? I mean, it's a little terrifying. Um, because I think yeah, it's the thing I kind of crashed crashed over the hundred stories barrier last year. Um, and there's something kind of at the point you do that where you kind of go, I'm quite proud of that, but also it's kind of far too many. And uh, you know, I. I probably kind of want to write a little bit less now because I feel that you know it's, it's it's ideally you kind of want this whole thing to kind of have a sort of natural growth so you kind of move on to other things and kind of move up and then career progression and a career ladder so you kind of leave a bit of space for the people um, who are starting out and kind of uh, yeah, and I mean, also yeah. speaking on that I mean uh, another question I have here is like uh, it kind of relays back to Dom as well. Uh, I mean, he he mentioned you when I brought him on the show as well, and he mentioned how you kind oh, of yeah. uh, talked about this world and how you talk about Big Finish. And uh, over the years, more creative voices have joined the Big Finish team. Uh, what's it like working with new creative voices and at times introducing them to that world? Oh, it's 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 terribly exciting. I mean, um, it, it, it's all there's something so joyous about finding people who can really do it because mm. it's not everyone. That's I'm going to be you know blunt with that. Sometimes. You know, you get a script through from somebody, uh, and you're going to go, "Oh, they're not. They don't quite have the in, innate understanding." But there's always like discovering someone like you know. I remember like very much reading the, the first Guy Adams script I ever read, and very and the first Tim Foley script I ever read, where you kind of go, "Oh, great! This is good and amazing." And it it just feels like it's the sort of the natural way of, of, of developing these things. So I kind of always very keen to try and go out and find people and and, and bring people in and. Uh, it, I mean, it, it keeps it keeps everyone on their toes, really, because, you know, um, people will come along with different sort of influences. Uh, I always find it quite interesting as well. We don't, you know, often 
particularly in order to try and you know diversify the workforce a bit um we'd veer to people who weren't necessarily as familiar with doctor who um and often you'd kind of suggest to people well do you want to write something oh, well i don't really don't really watch doctor and you have this but we go that kind of doesn't matter in a way because i do that and what you'll come with is is uh, a slightly different understanding of, of the rules and you might do things that i wouldn't have naturally anticipated doing because you're you know i'm i'm sort of blindly obeying rules that i don't necessarily even feel are there whereas you kind of come in and do things you know so having those kind of things can be sort of quite useful and interesting and you know, bringing someone in to break it but... there was a recent fan project called the might of the daleks and yes Nez, uh very obviously very talented youtuber and uh creator and one of uh, in the behind the scenes he revealed that uh they were the only kind of doctor who fan on set them and the director really yes Everyone else on set had no uh, no kind of familiarity or kind of that kind of fandom connection. And uh, Josh talks about how it kind of gave him a film, uh, more of a filmmaker's perspective in that uh, it kind of, I, I, think, I personally think there's a lot of merits to being a fan and writing for it and writing for Doctor Who and working on Doctor Who such as yourself. Mm. And most fan work. And I feel like there's, there is a there are a lot of merits to not knowing Doctor Who, jumping into the world and having that unique perspective. I think once uh, I think Big Finish in particular has kind of found that balance of fans and uh, new writers and people inexperienced with the show that don't that don't want it watch it as much. I think it's very interesting. I think it's very interesting hearing about it as well. Yeah. I think there's a degree to which you kind of have to have a certain love for it as a storytelling machine in a way make it machine probably the wrong word but um device i suppose or something like that um to kind of really sing with it um so yeah not necessarily being a fan of the show but kind of enjoying the ability to tell the stories within it i think is probably a kind of a a, a, a way of describing it because as you say a lot of people who've done quite a few quite successfully are not necessarily as big a fan of it as you might necessarily expect but enjoy the it, it is a, as a thing to write um so creative powerhouse if you will yes it, it's a it, it's a very very interesting show and, and i feel like shows that have been going on for 60 years do need that uh kind of you know that that balance you know uh, as mm. mentioned. and i feel like the show in itself and its expansive universe and media have perfectly kind of uh found that balance and i i look forward to seeing it continue <laughs> obviously <laughs> um, i'm dressing the sixth doctor show of course i'm looking forward to talk to you yeah, exactly. um, right <clears throat> final call as it were uh so uh i just genuinely want to ask you about your excitement for the 60th and there is another thing i want to ask you about as well and that's the current uh writer strikes in america at the time mm -hmm. of this uh obviously very important time um and the use of obviously, I, I I vehemently disagree with. I I hate the use of AI in writing, and so mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that sort of uh, Job. events, as it were. Oh, okay, as as in the sort of overall general thing. So thoughts on the sixtieth. Very excited for the sixtieth. Um, looking forward to it immensely. Um, looking forward to you know shooting Gatter as well. I know borderline nothing about it. Like the, the, the episodes that are coming up, um, occasionally you can just about intuit some things that are coming up on the basis of what um, you're not allowed to do. And yes. what the BBC kind of say, you can't do this. And you go, oh, that means you're doing this. But I obviously am not going to say any of those things right oh. now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, obviously having written for Tennant and uh, Tate, um, yeah, I, I kind of think they're both great and looking forward to having them back. And... Yeah, should be excited. I don't. I'm the faintest idea what they can do with it, really, because you know, obviously, there was a degree to which yeah. uh, power, power of the Doctor kind of covered a lot of things that you'd sort of half expect in an anniversary special, and then just makes the whole thing seem like a big run of specials. So yeah, uh, which is not technically, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to complain. Like two years of specials, no. um, so that's all good fun. Uh, the writer strike um, in America. I mean, obviously, I'm very supportive. Of it, very supportive of it. I. Um, 
it's not something I'm terribly familiar with, not having kind of worked in America and not particularly, you know, done anything outside the Finnish sort of here. But, um, you know, from what I, I can gather, it does feel like uh, it, it's all important stuff that, you know, where people are cutting corners and uh, and trying to avoid paying the right as much just in order to get more money for the shareholders and not really kind of respecting the people who are actually making the work. So, um <clears throat> Yeah, it's kind of, kind of looking at it as it is. I mean, it is so phenomenally difficult getting a show on. Um, anyway, I know, that, you know, various people uh, who have been in development processes, both here and on the other side of the pond, um, where the hoops they've had to go through for basically no money yeah. over an entire year. And then uh, had, a, had in, in one particular case, there was yeah, a friend of mine who, and I won't specify it is because it might get back. Okay. Uh, but yeah, they, they did a pilot then we developed it over and over again across the years, according, you know, getting notes and improving it, finessing it and sent it through. And the, the, the executive development on this streamer just went, yeah, you know, I'm going to say no, just in the book, just a feeling, just a feeling. And you go, what? After a year of work. And they kind of were absolutely broken. I mean, to be fair, I think hopefully they'll be able to take it to somewhere else, but, yeah. um, but it is, um, it's all just kind of insane. I I I, I think uh, also that you know the way things are so dictated by sort of algorithms of and is kind of insane. I think that there was in particular there was it was it something like eighteen ninety nine is the one that was like something like that a title with that I can't remember the title specifically. It was a year uh, by the people who did Dark as I remember. Yes. Oh. Little yeah. Ship. yeah. And and uh, that came out and I thought oh oh yeah I quite fancy that I might watch that at some point. Um, but I didn't, but I was you know, midway through other shows and there's the release and you're going, okay, I didn't feel the urge to watch it that specific exact second. And then within a month, it had been can within a month it had been canceled. So it wasn't going to be another run. And you're having this bit go, can you not give us time to actually like, let, let something build up a bit? Why does the decision have to be now? So, um, because, because immediately it went from something I was quite interested in seeing and then my, but then you go, but now you've just, you, you, it feels self-defeating because not everyone can there is so much content you can't watch everything right the second it's released it's not going to happen unless it's literally something like you know the sandman or whatever where it's something for me where it's something like this is something i'm really excited about seeing so even then i kind of took my time over it yeah. um it's um it, you know you want I, I yeah i feel it's just all terribly misguided it's all about you know pleasing shareholders and kind of making as much money as they can for the shareholders, which means a lot of the time cutting back. But also I think it's an incredibly false investment because obviously, um, you know, the more money you're taking away from the people who are actually making it and to make money for the investors, then I, I think the quality will deteriorate and then you make less money for the investors. I, I, th I feel it's one of these things that, that kind of gets under, underrated. The best way of gaining viewers is really to make a good program, not to kind of particularly, um, you know, do anything too kind of problematic. The, 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 a good show will kind of find an audience, I think, with with enough time if you promote it properly. Yeah. Um, that is basically that you need to be found. But um, it, it spend a bit of money and then you'll you'll get that back. It's but I mean, I think it is the problem obviously with the streaming as well that it's very nebulous where that money comes from. You yeah. know, it, it's not as straightforward as like you know, I buy a DVD or or buy a ticket for a film. And people know where that money is going, but um, you, you know, I, I yeah, I, I, the whole thing is complicated, and it, and and so therefore means it kind of makes it a bit harder to value these things. And you know, I I I feel that streaming may be about to burst at some point because you know, it went from being quite a good idea when the, it was pretty much just Netflix, where you go, well, you get Netflix and you get all of these, and now it's like you have to buy six or seven different streaming services, and you know, and, and... actually, quite a lot of them will dissolve. Obviously, you'll probably. You'll still have your Disney Pluses. You'll still, I think Netflix has potential to survive, but considering everyone's just leaving Netflix, I mean, as soon as the others are solved, they'll probably all come back to Netflix. Yeah. Netflix will probably be overloaded uh, mm -hmm. by the sheer amount of content. Like, I, I don't I don't know how they afford half the content that they have or half the stars that they get. I, 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 I don't know, but I heard somewhere uh, through various articles that they barely can. <laughs> I mean, it's more like, <clears throat> and then you, you, you think about it like you don't really know who's profiting, really, at the end of the day, yeah. a lot of the time. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and now you have companies threatening to use AI instead of writers. Yeah. And, you know, uh, that's just in itself, I think, lazy completely. I mean, I th yeah, AI, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I mean, the thing is, though, I mean, it, it's hard not to expect that there will be some point where um, AI, I don't think AI is quite there yet. It's not um, there. Yeah, but I think certainly in terms of writing, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, that will kind of uh, reach that point where it will analyze these things well enough. I mean, whether it whether what it produces actually has a soul and the kind of spark, I don't know. But I do think that I mean, I think it's potentially rep replicatable at some point. But I, I think um, I mean, I think that what I suppose it's a question of how much is valued. I mean, because you can probably, if you're a big studio, then do this thing of creating stuff at that kind of rate without kind of um, necessarily bothering to pay a writer I um, think, so i think i think their logic at the moment is get ai to write something and then get a writer in to finish it yeah Use it as a template but that's not that's that sounds all manner of rubbish to me i mean i i think um i i, I think that <clears throat> i think ultimately like a lot of good work springs from something i don't think you can replicate moments of inspiration moments of um yeah, we're, we're finding a new angle on something, which I, which by definition I can't really do. But um, they are by definition not original as such. But no, I mean, you know, we'll we'll see. I mean, I suspect that for somewhere like um, for somewhere like Big Finish, for example, I don't think it'll necessarily have become a problem. I know, I know, because there's, weirdly, there's been a degree of fury about potentially it being on on covers, which I don't know about really. Um, I don't think. Also, I would say that if that. If that's the case, it's not big finish suddenly going yes we will use AI on covers now it's like a specific artist decides to use it or whatever and you know and if there are AI actors in Torchwood that's probably just the AI story and then playing AI for whatever reason which is kind of you know potentially fair enough but it's 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 yeah I I, I think in a weird way that you can see where something as soulless and faceless as a big international corporation would probably go this is a, a cheap way to cut corners I think that at the same time on a smaller level theatre and stuff like that where people will kind of definitely still value um yeah the human part. a lot of the big shady corporations and sometimes audiences can sometimes not distinguish between smaller uh smaller like uh forms of entertainment compared to bigger companies uh i think there was there was in relation to big finish i think there was like something about uh there was someone there was like this whole thing months ago of people uploading stories to YouTube mm -hmm. and people yes. were like, oh, but uh, people were making comments like, um, oh, it's a good thing. You know, it, 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 people were treating, treating Big Finish as if it is some shady corporate, cor corporatized mm. company, which it isn't. It's, you know, it's quite a small company. It's quite a, you know, it, it, it's, not a small small company but it's you know it's not yeah, yeah. It, it it doesn't have the money to lose with yeah people. it's it's not like i mean not that i, I think not that i think you know you, you, it kind of makes any difference in terms of the money that's kind of coming in but yeah it, it, in terms of yeah it, the, the the difference it makes is far bigger than it would be for say something like say warner brothers exactly exactly and i think you know um and that's the thing with that thing that happened a while ago is that Big Finish does give audios away for free a lot of the time, mm. I think. But, uh, you know, that's uh, I do think that sometimes in the industry it is uh, quite... It, people can misconceive what, what companies are, you know, yes. the conglomerates and which ones would are struggling, would uh, are the victims of this, uh, of these actions by these big companies. Yes. But yeah. Um, uh, through through your work uh, as a writer for Big Finish, you've worked with a lot of arc based stories. You've worked with a lot of box sets with other writers. Mm -hmm. What is that sort of process like working with other writers? Because I know you have your white your writers group chat. You worked, uh, you mentioned uh, during our chat. yes. Uh, so what's the kind of writers room attitude like? Well, I kind of do, I mean it's the life. I mean, it kind of varies occasionally because um, sometimes you go off and figure out the plot for like a series of box sets um so that'd be something like say dark universe 
uh, for me in particular, and to a lesser degree, something like significant master plan had aspects of that. Um, but and and people go about it in different ways. So so some, someone like say Andrew Smith will kind of like have a really detailed brief of what you need to do for something like Unit Nemesis or Star Cops and kind of bump, like at some points half writes the story for you. Um, though fortunately, yeah, I've kind of had a bit of leeway with some of those. Um, uh, Matt can be a bit more sort of generalised, but even then we kind of have a vague notion. And I'm, I'm usually a bit more um, kind of just like sit in a room and have conversations with people and try and, and kind of get in the room. But uh, generally speaking, it, it ends up you're having a variety of different sort of Zoom calls like we're having now with a variety of different writers where you can kind of become great inspiration for everyone when you're kind of figuring out what you want to do with something. Even if it's as um, uh, straightforward as, say, like, you know, like you've normally got a shared thing in a box. I'm, I, there's one specific thing that hasn't been announced yet that I'm figuring out. Mm. I'm trying to find a way of phrasing it about it because it's been, it's been, well, I was on story one, uh, Lizzie's on story two, Tim Foley's story three, and us finding the sort of a, a sort of a shared connection and a shape to that, um, which which in something where people aren't used to it having a shape, but even then still being like individual stories that weren't, but you know, this will make sense in about a year, um, and uh, and there are other bits and bobs where it's just like you get to send emails and have discussions and and conversations. And and figure out what's a fun thing to do, and um, I I kind of love that in general. That that sort of is it, it kind of makes everything a bit better for everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. It makes you feel you're not quite um, in the same sort of horrifying place of kind of you're not alone. I found that a lot when with some of the like the lockdown stuff when it was all a little bit um, uh, quite uh, urgent. Yeah. And so, so usually there was this sense to go well. I, I'm I'm working at a pace I'm not usually used to. Uh, but at the very least, there are some other people who are doing exactly the same thing with exactly the same timing, and we can always like be there for each other if we need them, and and sort of sit down and have those chats and conversations and figure out what we want to do as a collective. Um, and yeah, I I I, I, I like other writers yeah. a lot. They're they're good people, and and I, I always kind of I can't remember where it was, but there was always I think there was some sort of thread somewhere on Twitter which was somebody kind of saying the other writers are your competition to go no they're not they're your friends you know um there's a you know they are kind of your sort of to a degree can be for the same sort of jobs but at the same time you're really not because everyone brings something different to the table yeah. um you know if people are like oh, i mean it's not i'm not in replacement for sort of tim or matt or whatever because it's people want a story that's my style in that sort and and vice versa really so um that they are people who know exactly what you're going through and are there to help you if you need it. This whole industry thrives on collaboration and that's yeah. something I think big shady corporations don't understand as much as writers and people actually working within the industry is that it thrives on uh, collaboration, humanity, uh, and just general just love for what we do. You know, it's just... I Yeah, I had I had one of those. It was because Lizzie Hopley said something very nice about this. Um, was mentioned it as a specific was when we were doing Dalek Universe and she was writing the first son she originally kind of had it on a jungle planet and I was kind of reading over and I was like okay, hold on so buying time starts with a, a crashed ship on a jungle planet there's a degree to which you could argue that um uh, was it circle of, cycle of destruction Roy's story of the which opened the second set also a bit of a jungle planet with a thing. And I was going to go, I don't think we can start every set with that. And she, so I was trying to figure out what the new planet could be. And I said, well, maybe because there's like, it's a field of battleships, they've all been like magnetised and come together to form a planet. And she went, oh, that's quite good. That's a good idea. I'll have that. You sure you don't want that? I was going, oh, I'll just have other ideas. And she kind of cited it as kind of, um, it's sort of a good thing. And that is a part of the useful thing of the process. You can kind of just like go, oh, here's an idea. Why don't you use that? And you can have that. It's fine. And it doesn't matter because there will be another idea when you need it that's for something else and there will always be other ideas you know that's the um the helpful thing and i think yeah a couple of times when it's been good to like volunteer things come up with things and then volunteer them to other people to write um where it kind of feels useful so, yeah i mean that that highlights the best of the industry in my opinion that, that highlights yeah. the best one could have but yeah um so that was kind of my final question for the podcast it's been a joy talking to you it's been it's been lovely speaking to you too so um yeah so if you have anything to like promote uh by all means mention now and i'll put them 
in the description. Box. I mean, you, you've mentioned like the podcast and the and the run, and I, and if people have listened this far and don't know where to find the Big Finish audios, I don't think the link's going to help them. Frankly, um, yeah, but they'll, they'll, there's all manner of exciting stuff coming out. So yeah, kind of keep your ear to the ground. Yeah, well, it, once again, it's been a joy talking to you. Uh, for everyone watching, make sure to subscribe, leave a like, uh, etc. Yes, do that. <laughs> it helps by some algorithm stuff. All right. Well, that'll be all from me and all from John. And thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'll stop recording.